Kb.
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, I actually read it right there already. Okay. Even at the end of all of these, can I try to get We're discussing eliminating instruction in the appropriate time to read it, but they haven't got this yet. Okay. Well, and I haven't done with the top three guys about that, but based on the case law, it needs to be included in the jury instruction. Yeah. yeah. I just didn't know if they wanted it contemporaneous, uh, and they were suggesting maybe after the, you the conclusion of these witnesses. You've got like two more? No, it won't be a quick one. Is it? It's just very simple. And then, so two witnesses this morning, I think we can write it and say you have a testimony from these witnesses. Okay. And, and just they, add their names up. This, okay. okay. And then we'll do that one verbatim in the final packet of the jury chart. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Very Anything else we're going to do outside first? Are we ready for this? Yes, we're ready. All right. Adam, is everybody good? Yes, sir. Well, like, I should probably confirm that. <laughs> Seated as uh, the jury is offered in that time for okay. We are back on the record at C250966, Dow versus Thomas Randolph. I hope everyone has a great week. Welcome back. Mr. Randolph is present as attorney deputy district attorney on behalf of the state. Can both parties stipulate to the presence of our jury? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. State, are you prepared to call your next witness? Yes, Your Honor. Um, the state calls Antoinette Dean. Okay. Antoinette Beam, A-N-T-O-I-N-E-T-T-E-B-E-A-M. May I proceed, Your Honor? Yes. Thank you. Um, do your friends call you Tony? Yes. Okay. Did you have a friend by the name of Sharon Randolph? Yes. Um, do you remember approximately what year you met Sharon? Around 2004. Okay. And what were the circumstances? Did you work together or how did you meet? Through a friend of mine. Okay. Um, when you met her in um, 2004, um, was she uh, living at her house on Rancho Santa Fe Drive? Yes. Um, when you first met Sharon, did you guys go out and do things together, or did you talk to each other on the phone? What was the, what did oh, you do most? Well, um, at first, when I met her, she was actually actually dating a, a male friend of mine. So uh, we didn't go out until after they stopped seeing each other. Okay. And then you two became friends? Yes. <laughs> um, and what kinds of things would you do with her? Um, go, uh, you know, watch live bands, um, go to the casino, um, and just, you know, talk on the phone a lot. Did Sharon like movies? Yes, yes. I didn't go to movies with her. I'm not a big movie person, so. <laughs> but
but yes, she did. Okay. Um, in, a, in the time period of 2008, um, did you see each other day to day during that time period? Uh, we saw each other off and on. Um, you know, I worked. Uh, she was working too, so we didn't see too much, but we did a lot of phone talking most of the time. When you say you talked on the phone, um, are you talking about daily, multiple times a day, weekly? Oh, yes, daily, m more than once a day. Okay. We would talk sometimes, yeah. Okay. Um, at some point, did um, Sharon introduce you to a man she was involved with by the name of Thomas Randolph? Yes. And do you see him in the courtroom today? Mm, yes, I do. Could you point to him and describe what he's wearing today, please? Right there with the blue shirt. Your Honor, may the record reflect the witness has identified the defendant? Your Honor, so um, Where were you when you met Mr. Randolph? Uh, we, uh, Sharon and uh, Mr. Randolph and I, we went to uh, the Sand Dollar Lounge. Okay, so just sort of a, a night out? Yes. Okay. Um, did you um, did you ever see him or go over to their house for dinner once he was living at the Rancho Santa Fe house? Yes. And um, obviously they were living together at that point. Mm -hmm. Yes. What was what kinds of things would you do at their house? Just have dinner or what? Anything else? Uh, yeah, dinner. You know, hang out, watch TV. In your um, contact with Mr. Randolph, um, did you observe him to have any um, medical conditions or physical problems? Yes. He, he couldn't, his, his back was always bothering him. Did he ever comment to you about any medication he was on? Uh, yes. What did he say about that? Well, he had a lot of medication that he was on for his pain. Okay, and um, did he ever tell you he was a walking pharmacy? Yes, 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 he did. That was when I first met him. Okay. Um, do you know how it was that Sharon met Mr. Randolph? Online, on a dating line, okay. online dating thing. And in your conversations with Sharon, was it your impression that um, the relationship sort of progress slowly or, or at a different no. speed? No, yeah, it, it went pretty fast, yeah. Do you remember um, her ever discussing earns or life insurance? Yes, that uh, I called her one day and they were out and they were uh, shopping for earns. <laughs> and this was, um, it was right around, because, you know, they, they got married twice, so I don't remember if it was the first time or the second time, but I just remember uh, Sharon telling me, you know, well, you know, you, you have to plan for these things, um, you, you know, and we're getting old. And, and I said, well, Sharon, uh, two people in love aren't planning their death, <laughs> you know, so... I didn't understand why they were out shopping for urns. I never heard of anything like that before. Okay. Do you know of other activities that they did, like um, going boating or anything like that? Uh, Sharon liked to go bowling a, a lot, uh, and I know she took her grandson. Uh, I'm not sure. He, Tommy might have gone too. I don't know if he was actually bowling. Okay. It, I don't really remember, but yeah. It, she did like to go bowling. Are you aware of whether or not Mr. Randolph had a boat? Yes. Do you remember them doing that, going boating? Yes, they went out, they went boating, and oh. they had some sort of a, where he was going too fast and knocked her into the boat, yeah. Some sort of accident? Yeah. Um, do you remember them um, going on a cruise? Oh yeah, they, they went on a couple cruises, mm-hmm. Okay. How about like um, target shooting in the desert? Yep. Yes, they did that too. When you, um, I don't want to know what Sharon said, but when you heard about some of these activities, did you express any concern to Sharon? Yes. What did you tell Sharon? That I wasn't comfortable with her doing these things, and most likely it must have been because of how fast the relationship went. Um, 
he was, you know, adamant about the uh, life insurance. And then I think the last straw might have been the earns thing. I'm like, the, this all just doesn't make any sense. Like, you know. The, so you warned her? Yes. Do you remember whether or not um, Mr. Randolph was ever gone uh, during holidays? Yes. Do you remember which holidays those were? Uh, Christmas and Valentine's Day. Okay. And without telling me what she said, what was Sharon's emotional uh, state when he was gone? Uh, yes, yeah, she was very upset, crying, and just, yeah, very depressed and mad, uh, just everything. Okay. And she, you know. Were you aware that the absence was because of another relationship that Mr. Randolph had? Yes. Um, during your um, friendship with Sharon and um, knowing Mr. Randolph, did you ever meet an individual by the name of Michael Miller? Yes. Where was it that you met him? Well, I believe both times were probably at the house, at Sharon's house. Okay, in the house on Rancho Santa Fe? Yes. Mm -hmm. And what, was the, what were the circumstances? Uh, as far, like, like was it dinner or he just happened to be there? Uh, one time I went there uh, just to talk to her and he was there. I didn't, I don't think, I don't know if I knew he was there, but I just went over to the house. And then there was a time where we did have dinner. Yes, okay. we all had dinner. When, um, I know it's not a huge number of times, but in the two times that you met Mr. Miller, how would you describe his demeanor? He was... Uh, pretty quiet and he uh, he was polite and co but and quiet okay yeah did um, in the time that um, during the dinner one that you described yes. the occasion when he was at dinner was he talkative at dinner um, he, uh, sort of, he was talking to my son uh, at the time about um, you know they were trying because you know, to t keep my son from, you know, doing the wrong thing, stay out of trouble type of thing. And then uh, Michael just kept on talking and, and Tommy uh, told him to stop talking. So Mr. Randolph directed Michael Miller to stop talking? Yeah, because he, he was like, you know, and that you're... kind of thing. That's what he's like, no, no, no more. Okay, so he was sort of gesturing to him as well as like, you're done talking. Is that yes? Yes, sorry. Um, once that occurred, did Mr. Miller stop talking? Yes. Was that the only occasion that you saw that because you only had the one dinner and then saw him the other time? Yes, pretty much. Um, do you remember if you um, spoke to um, Sharon um, on the day of her murder? Yes. Do you remember what time that was? Uh, between like, five and six. In the evening? Yes. Okay. Um, was it in person or by phone? The phone. And were you aware of plans she had that night? Yes. When she was going to dinner. With? In a movie, with Tommy. With yes. Tom, dinner in a movie? Yes. Now, on occasion, with over your relationship with um, Sharon, did you ever call her um, when she happened to be watching a movie at home or something like that? Yes. yes. And what was her habit um, with regard to that? Yeah, she always wanted to get off the phone, <laughs> you know, and I would get kind of frustrated sometimes, like, I need to talk to you, <laughs> and who cares about this dumb movie? <laughs> so it was really important to her? Yes. And would she call you after the movie, like, concluded? Yes, sometimes, depending on if it was late or whatever. Okay. Um, you mentioned, I think, earlier in your testimony that there were two weddings for the Randolphs. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, yes. Um, do you have any sense of when those were? That's just it. It's been so long. I, I, I can't remember. Um, I just know the the first one was in Mexico, and then they were supposed to have gotten married again but uh to to make it more uh legitimate or something like that and but we don't really kn i don't know when she did that you know none i wasn't there and 
So I, don't, I don't know where they did it. Okay, actually, that was my next question. You didn't attend either wedding? No, no. Okay. After, um, after Sharon's murder, did you have any conversations with the defendant about what had happened? Yes. What were the, how long after the, the murder did uh, he talk to you? It was pretty fast. It uh, might have been that same day, I, um, maybe. Yeah, because, um, yeah, he told me to um, not to, you know, don't t to tell Colleen not to come to the house. Okay. So I'm pretty sure it was that day. Something bad happened and tell Colleen not to come to the house. So it was that day. Okay. Did, was this conversation by phone? Yes. Um, did he indicate that um, he um, had shot somebody? Yes. Who, who did he indicate he had shot? Michael. Okay. Um, do you remember him ever commenting to you that Colleen was crazy? Yes. Was that in that conversation or later on? Yes. No, it was that conversation, yes. Okay. What did he say about Colleen? But she sees um, two psychiatrists and don't believe anything she says because she's crazy. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes. Show yes. Mm -hmm. I'm showing you um, what has been marked as state's proposed uh, 286, or sorry, 285. 286 and 287, and then one that's been admitted as 288. Okay. And I'm going to flip through these and just ask you if you recognize. I'll th flip through all of them. Okay. Um, do yeah. you recognize the individuals in those photos? Yes. State moves to admit 285 to 287. Any objection to doing that, please? All right, go for the admitting. I'm going to put what's been admitted as 285 on the overhead. Um, you, who are those individuals in that photo? Sharon and Tommy. Okay. You weren't there, though, when that happened? No. And this is 286. Appears to be another photo from that day. Sharon and Tommy. Yeah. This is 287. Yep, Sharon and Tommy. Okay. And what's been already previously admitted is 288. And Sharon and Colleen. I'll pass the witness, Your Honor. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. You and I have never spoken, as far as you know, right? No. Okay. Um, I'm one of Tommy's lawyers. I just have a few questions to ask you about what you just talked about on direct examination, okay? Okay. Um, I can sense, and I certainly understand, that you loved Sharon very much, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. You were friends with her for several years? Just a few years. Okay. And you talked to her a lot? Mm-hmm. Yes. And, I mean... Probably goes without saying, but um, probably broke your heart when she died, right? Yes. Okay. And I want you to know I am terribly sorry for your loss, and I'm terribly sorry that Mike Miller killed your friend. Okay? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. I have a few questions about some of the things you talked about. Um, you had spent some time with Sharon and Tommy together, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. And, and you keep saying, mm-hmm, it seems silly because I know exactly what you mean, but Victoria over here is going to be typing everything down yeah. at some point. Mm, yes. So the best you can actually say yes rather yes. than uh-huh or uh-huh. Yes, okay. okay. And then the only other thing I'm going to tell you is you got to wait till I'm done before you talk, and I'll do my best to wait till you're done before I talk because she can't get us talking over each other. Okay? Okay. I know it's different than talking in real life. Um... When Sharon talked about him, she referred to him as Tommy, right? Yes. And you knew him as Tommy, correct? Yes. Um, everybody that talked about him referred to him as Tommy, right? Yes. Okay. 
So when you say Mr. Randolph or something like on direct examination, that's not how you referred to him back in 2008, right? No. Okay. Um, Sharon liked to go out to eat, yes? Yes. And she went out to eat with Tommy, right? Yes. She liked to go to the movies, right? Yes. And she did that with Tommy, right? Yes. She liked to go out and see live music, concerts, right? Yes. And she did that with Tommy, right? Yes. When they started dating, um, she actually asked you, do you believe in love at first sight, right? Yes. Okay. Um, indicating to you that she felt she had fallen in love with Tommy at first sight, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and they appeared to have a very good relationship at first, right? Yes, at, okay. at first. There were times when Sharon was upset because Tommy had been seeing someone else, right? Yes. Um, you were aware that he had always made that known to Sharon, right? Yes. Like he didn't hide that fact, correct? No. Um, he talked to Sharon about it and Sharon talked to you about it, right? Yes. Did you ever talk to Tommy about it? No. Okay. Um, you were invited into the Randolph home for dinner, right? Yes. And you ate with Sharon and Tommy, correct? Yes. And at least on one of those occasions, Mike Miller was there, correct? Yes. You mentioned your son on direct examination. Do you remember mm -hmm. that? Yes. Okay. You had a son that was in his adolescent teenage years at the time, right? Yes. Um, and you had some concerns that he would be getting into some trouble, didn't you? Yes. And you actually asked Tommy and Mike to talk to him about that, right? Yes. And they did that for you, correct? Well, somehow the conversation came up. I don't know exactly. I just know that they were talking to him and I didn't mind it. I didn't deliberately, I'm sure I didn't say, hey, can you just talk to him about this? Somehow it came up. Okay. And bring it back to my question. You had indicated a moment ago that you actually talked to Tommy and Mike about speaking to your son, right? I didn't talk to them to tell them to talk to him. Somehow the conversation came up, and when they were talking, I didn't mind. Okay. Tommy was involved in that conversation, yes? Yes. And that was a conversation involving you... Um, your son, about him staying out of trouble, right? Yes. And you were appreciative of that at the time, right? Yes. Okay. Um, you indicated that you talked to Sharon the day that she died. Do you remember that? Mm, yes. Okay. Um, when you talked to her, you actually became aware of her plans for that evening. The state asked you about that, right? Yes. You knew that her and Tommy were going to a dinner and a movie, right? Yes. And you knew that was going to happen sometime around 6 p.m., correct? Well, I don't know what time, but yes, they were going out. She talked to you about what they were going to do that night, right? Yes. And she actually talked to you about what had happened earlier that day, right? Uh, I guess what happened earlier that day. Yeah, like for instance, you knew that Tommy had been to the bank, right? Yes. And that he had withdrawn a large amount of money from one bank, right? Yes. And that he was going to put that in another bank, right? Objection hearsay. It has to do with the existing state of mind of the person she was talking to on the telephone about their plans for that day and where he was at the time. Objection hearsay and foundation. No, right. Well, that would be over. She can testify about Sharon's state of mind. You were talking to Sharon on the phone, right? Yes? Yes. She told you where they were going that night, correct? Yes. She also told you that Tommy was going to come pick her up and that he was out running errands with Mike, correct? Yes. And that he had in his possession a large amount of cash, right? Yes. That he intended to put in the bank, right? Yes. Okay. Sharon knew all that, right? Yes. He and was she... either withdrawing or putting it in. I, I don't, I just know they were going to the bank. Okay. You remember you talked to a detective by the name of Dino Kelly on the 13th of May of 2008. Do you remember yes. that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. And you know that statement was recorded, correct? Yes. And you've had an opportunity to read that, right? Yes. And you would agree with me, having had an opportunity to read that, you know you told Dino Kelly back in May of 2008 that he was going to put a large amount of money in the bank, right? Yes. Because Sharon had told you that, correct? Yes. Okay. Um... And just to be clear, 
you knew that Tommy was with Michael that day before they were going to dinner, right? Yes. You said that Sharon told you in a phone call that she was out shopping for urns with Tommy, right? Yes. And you thought that was weird, right? Yes. You'd agree with me when Sharon told that to you, Sharon didn't think that was weird, correct? Nope. She thought that was just something that she was doing, right? Yep. And she did a lot of things in her life that maybe you wouldn't do, agreed? Yeah, I okay. suppose so. She, she's a different person than you, right? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. So the fact that she may think something is appropriate to do, whether or not you think it's appropriate, really doesn't matter, does it? No, but I'm her friend, so I'm allowed to tell her, you know, I don't think someone should be planning her death when right. she's supposed to be in love. Right. Because to you that's unconventional or different or weird, right? Yep. Yes. And she didn't think it was, did she? No. In fact, it was her idea, wasn't it? I uh, don't know about that. Okay. Just to be clear, Sharon never told you, hey, Tommy's making me pick out an urn. I don't want to do this, right? No, she didn't say that. Okay. Sharon didn't have any problem telling you things that she thought were off or weird or something going on in her mind, how she felt, right? Say that again? Did Sharon have any problem telling you when something was going on in her mind? No. Did she tell you how she was feeling? Yes. Okay. You said you talked to Sharon on the phone daily, right? Yes. Sometimes several times a day, right? Yes. And you actually knew what kind of phone service she had at her residence, didn't you? Yes. It was a company called Vonage. Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Yes? And sometimes when you talk to Sharon on the phone, the call would just drop, right? Yes. And that happened several times, correct? Yes. That was a thing that you knew from talking to her that the phone, the Vonage service at her house, would often go out, right? Yes. And when it went out for a period of time, you couldn't connect with her, right? Well, we would get on, I'd, she'd call me on her cell phone. Right. When the Vonage service went out, you sometimes would try to call her back, right? Yes. And you couldn't get her, right? Right. Because the Vonage service was out, correct? Yes. And so then to communicate, you would have to transfer to a cell phone, right? Yes. And that was a relatively normal thing in your relationship with Sharon, correct? Yes, but I would try not to call her on that. I would only call her on there if I'd call her phone and she didn't answer the cell phone and if I really wanted to talk to her. I'd so, call the home phone. So is it your testimony that the majority of your calls were on the cell phone? Yes. Because the Vonnet service was that unreliable? Yes. Tony, how many times um, do you think you, in the, like in a month's period, how many times do you think you would have called Sharon, on average, on the Vonage line? Uh, like I said, if, if uh, I couldn't get a hold of her on her cell, or I guess if I knew she was home, sometimes I'd call the home. But most of the time I called the cell phone. Okay. And on those times, how many, I guess what, I, what I'm asking is over a month's period of time, how many times do you remember the Vonage dropping out or having a problem? Yeah, it would have problems, but I mean, it wasn't every single time we talked. So, yes, it, the, it did have problems sometimes. Okay, sometimes meaning like once a week or once a month, or what would you say? Um, I guess once, uh, I don't know, once or twice. A month, I don't know, something okay. like that. And, and then you would just call on a different line or call back? Or... Yeah. So, Mr. Tomchak asked you about this um, shopping trip to buy urns. Yeah. Um, 
Had Sharon ever done that with the like the mutual friend that you guys had that um, she was dating? Was there some effort no. to buy urns or make funeral plans? No. I mean, she didn't really talk about... Um, she was pretty healthy other than her arm, you know, so she didn't really have a problem worrying about, you know, not being alive for too long, <laughs> you know, so no, yeah. it wasn't something we talked about until then. Okay. Mr. Tomchak asked you um, about this, uh, these errands that um, Mr. Randolph was running with Mike Miller on the day of uh, Sharon's death. Do you recall those questions? Yes. And um, based on what Sharon was telling you, your understanding is they were going to a bank and that sort of thing? Yes. Um, do you re do you remember if she had concerns about that? No, I, I I guess not. Do you remember what you told the police? Her comment was about him withdrawing this money. No, I don't. Would looking at your interview um, from that uh, year refresh your memory? Yes. This is page nine, counsel, of the voluntary. Question. I'll ask you a question. One okay. second, just let you know how you're doing. Okay, okay, yeah. Having, having looked at your um, interview, which was on um, May the 13th of 2008, does that refresh your recollection as to whether or not she was concerned about this money being withdrawn? Yes, yeah. That, I, now, yeah, she didn't know what he was doing with it. And she was concerned he was going to leave her again? Yes. You yes. told the police that back in 08? Yes, that is right, yes. Um, there was discussion about all the activities that Mr. Uh, Randolph and Sharon engaged in. Do you have any sense of when those activities took place in their relationship? Like, was it at the beginning, the whole time, in the middle? How would you describe it? Uh, I suppose most of it was in the beginning because towards the end, um, he was always in so much pain and he just laid around, slept most of the time. Did it seem to you like the relationship was um, happy and... Um, functioning no. properly at the end? If you could even bring up that one picture, they both look pretty miserable. If you, yeah, then that was, um, I be, well, that was one of their wedding days. I don't know which one it was, but yeah, no, they neither, they weren't happy. Okay, and in May of 08, um, was Sharon ha indicating she was really happy in the marriage and, and everything was going great? No, she was happy that day, that night that they were going out, but no, she wasn't, she wasn't happy. Okay, thank you. Okay, no problem. I'll pass the witness show. Did you pick which photos the state was going to show you? No. They did, right? Yes. Okay. You ever looked at a photo of yourself later and looked at your face and said, oh, that's not a very good photo of me? Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I've done that. I'm going to show you what's in evidence is 286. This is the state's photo. You said they look kind of miserable in that photo, right? Yes. Um, you'd agree this is their wedding day, right? Yes. Uh, I, I assume... Yeah. That that's what that was. You told us before that they were out and doing a lot of stuff at the initial parts of their relationship, right? Yep. Yes. Yes. And that included the time when they got married, right? Yes. Okay. Um, you'd agree with me in 285, that's, they're wearing the same outfits, right? Yes. They don't look too unhappy there, do they? Well, you can't see too much of their face, but no, right. I guess not. Because they're kissing each other, yes. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. That appears to be something you do when you're 
Having a good time, right? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you 287. They sure look like they're having fun in that picture, don't they? Yes. You agree with that, right? Yes. Okay. In fact, when you talk to law enforcement on the 13th of May of 2008, right after Sharon was killed, you told Detective Dino Kelly that their relationship was good, didn't you? No, I didn't. You didn't say that? No. I believe I said um, it wasn't, she wasn't happy. He was, he was leaving her all the time. Sharon told you she loved Tommy, didn't she? Uh, at some point in time, but maybe before all the drama he put her through. Okay. When you talk about all the drama that he put her through, you're talking about looking back at a relationship 15 years ago, aren't you? No. You're not? I don't know what you mean. Well, she died in 2008, right? Yes. Okay. You're talking about a relationship between 2005 and 2008, correct? Yes. Okay. You agree with me, 2008 is like 15 years ago, right? Okay, yes. Okay. You'd agree with me that you don't like Tommy Randolph, do you? No. Yes, I do agree with you. No, I don't like him. Right. And you and some of Sharon's other friends have been standing out in the hallway last Friday and today, right? Yes. Yes. Talking about how you don't like Tommy Randolph, right? And other things, but yes, I'm sure that came up. Right, and you want justice for your friend, right? Yes. And you want to see Tommy get in trouble, right? Get in trouble? Yeah. Uh, I just want to see justice for what he did. Right. You know, To not only Sharon, Michael too. Yeah, you know as you sit here today, Mike Miller shot your friend in the head, right? That's the story. We're still not sure if what happened. None of us are there. So, right. That's precisely my point. You weren't there, right? No. But you're here. Yes. Yes. And you agree with me? You don't like Tommy, right? Yes. Okay. Pass the message. And follow the order. So you were you were just asked by Mr. Tom Check about um, I think you said all the all the drama in the relationship. What did you mean by that? Uh, like I said, him leaving. Uh, he left quite a few times, and he would bring his stuff in and then take all his stuff out. He had um, he would get you know people from like uh, Home Depot stuff like that to come move his things out. Um, and then, you know, he was, she would lose things, and then all of a sudden, mysteriously, he found it, and look, it was here the whole time, dummy, and, you know, just the way he talked to her and, um, you know, and treated her. Um, so let me... Let Christmas me. and Valentine's Day, you, you, you go to California to be with someone else, I mean... Did, did you feel he was disrespectful to Sharon? Yes. And did you feel that um, the relationship was not healthy for her emotionally? Yes, it was definitely not healthy for her. And as all. her friend, you were concerned about all kinds of things? Yes. Thank you. Any follow up on that? No. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, does Jerry have any questions for this witness? Okay, seeing no response, maybe I'll ask you. Thank you very much for your testimony today. You too. Thank you so much, too. Yeah.
Correct. And next witness is Alice Wolf. I do. Thank you. Please be seated. Okay. If you could state this by the name of the record, please. My name is Alice Wolf, A L I C E W O L F E. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Ms. Wolf, were you friends with Sharon Randolph? Yes, I was. <coughs> um, how did you two meet? I met her at the hair shop when she came there to work. And were you also working there? Yes. yes. And what hair shop was it? The hair shop. Uh -huh. What was the name of it? The hair oh, shop. Oh, the hair shop. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not picking up on that. Um, and what, do you remember approximately what year this was? It was in the early 90s, 1990s. Okay. Did there come a point when she didn't work there anymore? Yes. And maybe she worked somewhere else? Yes. Um, did you still maintain your friendship with Sharon? Yes, I did. Um, during sort of the period of January through May of 2008, how frequently were you talking to Sharon? What was the dates again? So the, the last six months of her life, how, how often would you say you had talked? Oh my goodness. Maybe two, three times a day. Okay, so quite a bit. A lot, yes. Usually by phone? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, did Person you, <laughs> as well. Did you guys uh, go out and do things together? Yes, we did. What types of things did you do with Sharon? We'd go shopping. We'd go to the movies. We'd go to lunch. Okay. Did, um, because of the time frame you're giving us, uh, you knew her before she met Thomas Randolph? Yes. Um, at some point, you're aware that she met him? Yes. Um, and did she, without telling me what she said, but she let you know she was involved in a new relationship? Yes, she told me. And were you two still working together at that time? Mm, no, I don't believe so. We, she was kind of like coming in and out okay. of the shop. So she could have been working elsewhere. You know, I really don't remember that, but... Okay. Do you remember discussing... Yes, she was. She was working somewhere else. Yes. Oh, okay. Do you remember her um, talking about uh, things that they did as a couple, that sort of thing? She only said that she had met him, Mr. Randolph, and that they had gone to a concert. Okay. Um, did you feel like the relationship was moving fast? Pretty, yes. Okay. Yes. And would that have been based on conversations that you had with her about the relationship? Uh, I suppose, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, do you remember ever meeting, or well, do you remember the first time you met Mr. Randolph? Yes, I do. Where was it? It was at the hair shop. It was on a Sunday. And do you remember the year or anything like that? It had to have been like 2000, maybe two, four, five, I don't know. 2004 or five? Mm -hmm. And it was at the hair shop, you said? Yes. Okay. What were the circumstances? Why, why was he there? Well, she called me and said, uh, can you come to the shop? And I said, I never went there on Sunday, but she would, would go there now and again just to do a client you know, and I guess she was going to give him a permanent. Okay. And she had said that she had met this man, this guy, 
this guy and that she wanted me to meet him. I said, oh, I can run by. So did you go to the hair shop? Yes, I did. And um, do you remember uh, interacting with him or how would you describe what happened? He was, I was in the shop sitting at my station and waiting for her to come and they walked in and she sat him down and then she, she had already told me a few things about him, like, you know, who he was and all that. And then she went in the back to prepare the, the rods or whatever she was going to put, use for his hair. And so I got up and I stood behind him. He's sitting in the chair and I'm standing behind him and I said, looking in the mirror, and I said, well, so Tommy, tell me, um, just to, to get to know him, right? I right. said, I understand you like the, the Cowboys. The football team. Football team. And he just kept looking down. He did not ever look at me. Did he answer? He just said, yeah. Okay. Did he... Didn't look at me, didn't look in the mirror, nothing. I asked him, uh, how was the concert? I believe that's what I asked him. I can't remember really, but he didn't actually answer. Okay. So he I was remember. not engaging he was, with me. He was not engaging in any conversation with me. Okay. Um, the relationship, though, continues between uh, Sharon and Tommy. Yes. Um, did you ever express concerns to Sharon about your view of the relationship? Yes, I did. On how many occasions do you think you expressed concerns to Sharon? Probably every time I would talk to her. Okay, so a number of times. Yes. Um, and she kept seeing him? Yes. At some point in time, does, uh, she ha does she ask you to go with her to make a will? Yes. Do you remember what year that was? I, would, I cannot remember the year. Okay. Were you a witness on the will? Yes. May I approach her on it? Yes. This will, I'm gonna show you um, what's been admitted as page 309. And move this just a little bit? Sure. Okay. So here's the front page, and then there's some signatures here. Mm -hmm. um, do you recognize this document? Yes. Okay. Is this the will that you had uh, made with Sharon? It looks pretty much like it, yes. So I'm going to put this on the board. So tell me where it was that you went to, to get this will done. Well, I'm, I met her in the parking lot of um, the hair shop. Okay. And then I got in her car and she drove me, I, I believe it was on Rainbow. Uh, it was like a postal service, okay. I believe. And they had a notary there. And that's what she needed. She needed to have a notarized uh, the will. Okay. And so this was like a, a pre-printed document that she got at like one of those post office businesses? Well, I don't think she picked it up there. I don't know if she already had it. Okay. But I remember that we were standing on a table at a stand-up table type. And she was like writing this out. Okay. And um, did, is, is this her writing like she would have filled it all out? I mean, you didn't fill it out for her. I this. did not fill it out. Okay. This is her. This is hers. Okay. Her. And so there's some property described and some bank accounts described and jewelry. Yes. And then uh, she leaves everything to my only child, Colleen Byer. Yes. Do you know Colleen Byer to be her daughter? Yes, I do. And looking at the last page of 309, 
Um, it looks like it's 24th of January of 07, and it looks like there's a signature of Alice Wolf, mm -hmm. and then uh, Floyd Wolf. Right. Who is Floyd Wolf? My husband. Okay. So you two witness it, and then it's notarized. Is that right? Correct. Now, did you know what Sharon had written on, you know, in terms of the directives of this will? Did I know? That yeah, did she tell you, look, this is what I'm doing? Oh, she, she asked me, um, do you, does this look right to you? And I said, well, sure, yeah. Okay. What did she do with this um, after she filled it out and it was notarized? She folded it up, put it in an envelope, and handed it to me. And what did you do with it? Well, prior to that, I said, why are you giving it to me? And she said, because if anything happens to me, I want you to give it to Colleen. Okay. So what did you do with it? I put it in my bank uh, deposit box at okay. the bank. All right. Now, at some point, um, Sharon um, dies, and, and what, do you, what do you do with that document? I went to the bank. I took it out. And I was working that, I had to work, uh, I think that was on a, I believe it was on a Friday. Um, I don't know if I did it or if my husband, I cannot recall, but I'm, I think it was my husband that went and got the letter, okay. the, the envelope, I, but I can't really remember. Okay. Did you ever get a phone call from Colleen indicating that she had received the document? I don't remember that. Okay. But I didn't hand it to her. My husband took it and left it at the house okay. for her. And you probably don't, I mean, because it wasn't you, you probably don't remember when that was done in relation it to It was her like death. immediately. Oh, shortly after her death? Mm -hmm. Is that yes? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, just prior to her death, did you know whether or not she was out of state, like in Utah? Yes. Where Were you in um, Las Vegas at that time? No, I was in San Diego. Okay. And do you um, just happen to have a residence in San Diego? Yes, I do. And actually, while we're on that, on occasion, did you let um, Sharon stay in that residence as like a little vacation? Yes, I did. After um, Sharon was killed, do you remember if you ever spoke to Mr. Randolph? Yes, I did. How soon after her death? I believe she was murdered on a Thursday night. Friday morning. No, wait a minute. No, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I think it was a, a Wednesday. And then I, I was returning back from San Diego. So it had to have been like a Thursday. I get a phone call Thursday afternoon, and it was Tommy. And what did he tell you? He said, uh, something happened to Sharon. I believe that's what he said. And I said, I said, what happened to Sharon? Where is she? And I said, Tommy, what did you do to her? And he said, I didn't do anything to her. He did it. I said, who did it? He said, Mike. But he was very, very calm when he told me this. He was... Did you know who Mike was? I, I yes, I did. You knew, and what, did, what was your understanding as to who he was? He was a handyman that he had uh, found as a friend from some convenience store, is what she told me. Okay. Um, you were aware that um, Sharon actually was married to Mr. Randolph? Yes. Did you attend either wedding? No. From talking to Sharon, I, I now want to focus on the time period of 2008. Was it your impression that um, during that time period the marriage was going well, poorly? How would you characterize it right at the end? Very bad. Thank you. I'll pass the witness. Cross. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. How are you? Could be better. 
Yeah, pro probably not a lot of fun to come here and talk about this no, stuff. No, it right? isn't. Um, it's not fun because you cared for Sharon very much. Right? I loved her, yes, very much. Um, I'm very sorry for your loss. Um, she seemed like a, a lot of fun. Would you agree with that? Sharon is a big-hearted, loving, fun person, yes. Okay. Um, and, and I didn't know her, but that seems to be what everybody says about her. Knowing her, you'd agree with that assessment of her, right? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Um, and you know that she married Tommy, right? Yes, I found out, yes. And she didn't actually tell you that at first, right? No. Okay. I mean, you would kind of let her know that you didn't approve of Tommy, right? I certainly did, yes. Yeah, you didn't like him much, right? I didn't like him at all. But you know, she liked him a lot, right? At the beginning, yes. She fell in love with him, right? Well, I don't know if that would, I don't know. She would never tell me that, that she was in love. She, she never told you she was in love? No. Okay. Um, she never told you that it was love at first sight for her? She never mentioned that to me, no. Okay. Would it surprise you that she told other people that? Would it surprise me? Yeah. Well, I don't know if it would surprise me or not. Okay. I just had my own impression, and I told her right. what I thought. So let's talk about your impression. You told us that the first time you met Tommy was in a Sunday at the beauty shop, right? Yes. And she had actually brought him in on the weekend to do something with his hair, right? Yes. Um, Tommy always had, in the entire time you knew him, real long hair, right? Yeah. And they went to rock concerts together, right? Mm -hmm. I, yes. Yes? And you knew they enjoyed that together, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. In fact, Sharon came back after one of these rock concerts, and she was just over the moon. She had fallen for Tommy. That's your words, right? I believe so. The first time, yes. Okay. This first time you met him, when you were in the shop on a Sunday, Sharon was there and Tommy was there, right? Mm hmm Yes? Yes. She was going to do a particular thing to his hair, right? Correct. Um, and she was going to give him a perm, right? Correct. Okay. I've never had a perm, believe it or not. Um, but what I've seen is there's a process where you put rods in the hair and you kind of curl it up and you put it under this apparatus, right? Mm, well, you put the solution on and just sit there. Okay. You don't put it under anything. Before the solution's put on, she actually washes his hair, right? I believe so. Okay. Sure. You knew that Tommy was hard of hearing, right? I didn't know that. Okay. I don't did believe you, so. Did you know that he wore hearing aids? I did not know. Okay, so Sharon didn't tell you he was hard of hearing and wore hearing aids, right? No. Did you ever wash anybody's hair in the beauty shop? Absolutely, yes. Ever wash anybody's hair that had hearing aids? Yes. They ever take them out first? Yes. It's pretty normal, right? Pretty much. For people that wear hearing aids and take them out to get their hair washed, um, might be hard for them to hear, right? If they, if they take them out? Yes. Well, I guess so, yeah. Right. It depends so, on your hearing, I, you know. Yeah, so let's say you're uh, hearing at a 2 out of 10, just to work with a hypothetical number. Your hearing aids come out, that's all you can hear. That would be difficult to communicate with someone, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. I suppose, yeah. Did you ever have any of those people in all the times that you took out their hearing aids and washed their hair where you couldn't talk to them because they couldn't hear you? Never. Never? Not that I can say. Okay. Not when I'm right on them, on top of them. Okay. Would it strike you as unusual if someone was embarrassed about their hearing if they just kind of sat there quietly rather than trying to engage in conversation when they couldn't hear somebody? I don't think they'd be embarrassed. Okay. You wouldn't be, right? No. Can you accept the fact that maybe other people... There's a possibility, yes. Sure. Um, after that moment, you didn't like Tommy much at all, did you? I worked in this hair business for a long time, and I have can pretty much read people when I first meet them, and I disliked him very much. Okay. Just, I just got a creepy feeling about him. Right. Precisely my point. From the first time you laid eyes on him, when you tried to talk to him and he didn't respond to you, 
You didn't like him, did you? I just, did, no, I just, my, I think my gut feeling was I did not care for the man at all. Okay, you felt that in your gut? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. Okay. Um, in fact, after Sharon died, law enforcement didn't actually contact, I'm over here, ma'am. If you could just look this way. Sure. Thank you. If, and just for the record, I mean, you appear to be glaring at Tommy as you sit here today. You'd agree with that assessment, right? Yes. Because you pretty much hate him, don't you? I wouldn't say that, but I hate him. And okay, use your word. What is it that you have for him? I abhor him. Okay. Um, going out on a limb here, abhor kind of analogous to hate, right? That's a strong word, I suppose. Hate. Would you agree that abhor is a strong word, too? Not really. Okay. Um, after Sharon is killed by Mike Miller, and you find out about that, I want to talk to you about a couple pieces of that history. Tommy actually calls you the very next day, right? Yes, to tell me that. And he talks to you in what you described as a calm voice, right? Mm-hmm. Yes? Yes. And you understand the content of that call is Tommy is reaching out to Sharon's friend, i.e. you, to tell you she's been killed, right? I had to ask him what happened to her. Okay. Let me, let me walk you through it, okay? okay? He reaches out to you. He dials your number, right? Yes. And you have an understanding that it's to tell you something bad has happened to her, right? Yes. And he starts that conversation by saying, I'm sorry, Alice, but something has happened to Sharon, right? No, he didn't say, I'm sorry. Okay, he says, something has happened to Sharon. Exactly. Right? Okay. And you said, what happened? Put her on the phone. I want to talk to her, right? Yes. Okay. And he says, I can't do that. She's been killed, right? She's dead. Right. That's what he said, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. And your response is, what did you do to her? Exactly. And he told you, I didn't do anything to her, he shot her, right? He, he did it, is what he said. Right. And you knew eventually in that conversation that the he was Mike, right? Yes. Okay. So you'd agree with me that Tommy called you to tell you what happened, right? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. And you were pretty hostile with him, right? Yeah. Because yeah. you, ab yes. you abhorred him, right? Because I just did not like care for the man at all. Okay. Law enforcement.
All right, to the jury. suggest is I, I could call her and put my phone on speaker because I was able to call her when she was logged into Blue Jeans. I mean, I'd, I'd put it on speaker and you could just listen to it that way through the mic. It doesn't matter to me at all if the jury can hear it. Do you want me to try it? You want to try that? Yeah, Liz, I'm going to try to call you, okay? I'm going to just have Mr. Hunter put his phone number on the record, please. Oh, boy. That's <laughs> not happening. <laughs> Liz, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. Ma'am, if you could raise your right hand so the clerk can swear you in. You do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in this action shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you back? Yes. Can you, if you could state and spell your name for the record, please? Can you state and spell your name for us? Elizabeth Lavador. E L I Z A B E T H L A B A T O U R. Thank you very much. Uh, Liz, uh, do you know someone by the name of Thomas Randolph? Yes, I do. Um, where did you first meet uh, Tom? Years and years ago. I met him on a dating line. Okay. Where were you living at that time? Uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. Did you start to date him in Utah? Yes. At some point, did you move in with Mr. Randolph? Yes. Um, do you continue to live with him or does something change in the relationship? 
Yeah, we break up, but I know that. Okay. Um, while you dated Mr. Randolph, were there ever any discussions about life insurance? Yes. Okay, tell, tell us about who brought up the topic of life insurance while you were dating. Thomas brought up the topic. Okay, what did he tell you? He told me that I should get life insurance uh, for protection of my daughter and that we would make sure she got some money from it too. Okay. Um, how were you supposed to pay for the life insurance? He was going to pay for it and take care of it. I just did a blood test. Okay, so he offered to pay for the whole thing. Yes. About how much life insurance were we talking about? What I remember is 150000 Okay. How, who was the beneficiary of the policy? Half for Thomas Randolph and half for my daughter. So when you heard Mr. Randolph offering to pay for a life insurance policy under your name, how did you feel about that? I like the idea of getting some comfort to my daughter. So you were willing to do it under, under that context, correct? Correct. Who handled all the paperwork? Thomas. Okay, so what, did, what, are your, what, did you, what if anything did you have to do to set any of this up? A nurse came to our house and took a blood test. After, uh, at some point, do you break up with Mr. Randolph when you were living in Utah? Yes. Do you move somewhere else? Yes, I do. Where do you move to? I move to an apartment in Salt Lake. All right. Do you ever leave the state of Utah? Yes, I've moved to California. Um, during the time uh, that you were, uh, you stopped dating uh, Mr. Randolph, does your relationship stay off or does it kind of go back on and off? What do you remember? It always went on and off. All right. Um, are you familiar with the, uh, the name Sharon Randolph? Yes, I am. And how did you become familiar with Sharon? She was a lady... Thomas met online when we were in a breakup. Okay. Um, do you continue, do you become aware that Mr. Randolph eventually starts dating Sharon and eventually marries Sharon? Yes, I am. Yes, do you continue to have a relationship with Mr. Randolph during the course of him dating her and being married to Sharon? Yes. Yes. I want to ask you a little bit about um, contact. Um, while he is married to Sharon, does he ever reach out to you? Constantly on the phone. What are we talking about here? What, what, do, you, what do you mean by that, constantly? Uh, several times every day. Okay, how, how often during the week would he call? Oh, God. Uh, I don't know, 30, 40 times. Okay, so almost daily, or every couple of days in a week? Yes. Was that a one-way street, or did you call him about the same amount? What do you remember about who was calling who? I did not call him. He called me. All right. And was your number at the time 805-649-5792? Yes. Aside from phone calls, were there other ways that he tried to reach out to you or make contact with you? He would come, visit, okay, get so a phone call from Sharon and go back. All right, so you remember him coming, literally coming to meet you, is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, when he would show up, would he talk about whether what what the status of what he hoped to have happen in his relationship with Sharon in relation to you? What, what was going on there? He was leaving her every time he showed up. Okay. Did he did he show up just in a car or did he drive in something else sometimes? There were cars at times and U-Hauls at times with his stuff. What times of the year would he show up? Do you remember? All the time, about once a month, 
holidays. Did that include Christmas? Yes. Did that include Valentine's Day? Yes. Did he ever leave you like cards or greeting, like like love cards or anything like that? Greeting cards were constant. So, at some point, how do you feel about this back and forth between him going to Sharon and coming to you? How did you start to feel about it? I got very tired of it and told him it's not going to work anymore for me. He needs to make a decision. Okay, so you give him an ultimatum. Yes. Around when did this happen? When was this ultimatum given? I think around the Valentine's Day visit. In, in 2008? Yes. Okay, so a couple of months before Sharon passes away. Yes. When you gave him that ultimatum of, look, you really just need to decide, what was his response to you? He said he was going to go out and deal with Sharon so we could be together. No further questions for this witness. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. I guess it's actually good afternoon at this point. Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, question. Um, when Sharon died, did anyone from law enforcement in Las Vegas contact you? No. Silly question, but given that no one contacted you, you wouldn't expect there'd be a recorded statement that you ever gave to law enforcement, right? Right. Okay. Um, you talked to Tommy, and you, you called him Tommy, right? I did. And almost everybody called you Lizzie, right? Yes. Okay. In those conversations with Tommy, did he let you know that he had not kept you a secret from Sharon? Yes. And in fact, you've actually talked to Sharon before, right? Once, yes. Okay. Um, Sharon was aware of you and you were aware of Sharon. Is that true? That's true. Okay. Um, you mentioned this incident with life insurance. That was... Do you remember the time frame when that life insurance was purchased? We probably known each other a year and a half. Okay, what year did you meet? Um, not clear on dates. Okay, so you'd been in a dating relationship for a year and a half, right? Yeah, right. And, and you had talked about being together forever, right? Right. And that's all before Sharon, correct? Correct. And you and Tommy would have intense periods of getting along, right? Yes, we would. And then you'd have intense periods of not getting along, correct? Yes, we would. Okay. Um, knowing Tommy like you do, you know he kind of doesn't have a filter, right? Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. You know what I right. mean? You know what I mean by that? Oh, yeah. He kind of says what's on his mind, right? Yes, he does. And he's not bashful about using, like, for instance, four-letter words, correct? Yeah, correct. Okay. Um, he never hid that from you and tried to act like someone who didn't swear or anything other than what he is, right? Yes. Okay. Um, the purchase of life insurance by yourself was before Sharon was in the picture, right? Right. And in fact, there was a policy in place for a period of time, correct? Yes, it was. Um, and you consented to getting that policy, correct? Yes, we went to the office together. Right. I mean, my question's not clear. Tommy didn't make you do that, correct? Correct. You guys were talking about being together forever, right? Right. And you talked about getting life insurance so that your, the people you care about could be protected if, God forbid, something happened to you, right? Yes. Okay. Um, Super silly question, but you never got killed when you had that life insurance, did you? No, I didn't. 
Um, when you and Tommy split up, that life insurance was let to lapse, right? I have no idea. I was never a part of it. Okay. So you haven't continued to pay the premiums, correct? I never paid a premium. Right. You haven't continued to pay the premiums after you and Tommy split up, right? No. Okay. Right. Um, and you knew you were getting that life insurance, correct? Correct. You had to provide information on like a health questionnaire, a background about uh, your health and your genetic history and things like that, right? I'm not sure. I, I would think so. You actually provided a blood test, right? Yes, I did. And you did that voluntarily, correct? Correct. Okay. All right, so you remember when the defense counsel asked you the question about, oh, you know, this life insurance policy maybe was taken out maybe about one and a half years of you guys dating? Do you remember that kind of at the beginning of Cross? Yes. Okay, just to be clear, you weren't married when he's taking out a life insurance policy, correct? Never been married, yes. Okay, did you have a lot of boyfriends in your life that took out life insurance policies out on you while dating? Never. Okay. The next question is, do you remember when defense counsel asked you, so when you purchased the life insurance policy, you, the purchase of the life insurance policy by yourself, do you remember that being phrased to you on cross-examination? Yes, I remember. J just to be clear, did you ever pay a single dime for the life insurance policy? No, I did not. Who is the person that provided every payment of premiums on that life insurance policy? Tom had the paperwork and made the payments. You were asked a question on cross-examination. Just to be clear, he never made you do this. Do you remember that question on cross? Yes, I do. Whose idea was it to even do this? It was Thomas's idea. And how did, and, and what it, why did he what did he say to suggest to you that this would be a good idea? He said Everybody gets them, and your daughter needs protection. Okay, so he mentioned the fact that you should protect your daughter, correct? Correct. But he would get a 50% cut? Yes. You were asked a question, oh, I know this is a silly question. Uh, you didn't get killed after your life insurance policy. Do you remember that question? Yes, I do. Okay, just here's another silly question. You moved out, right? Yes. yes. No further questions. Liz, thank you very much. Hold on. Sir. Oh, so sorry. sorry. Oh, I thought he said I'm done. Sorry. I'll no, we haven't answered you. And we still have the jury on there, He's jumping ahead. <laughs> you still there? Lizzie? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. M Mr. Hammer was trying to get rid of you before I was done asking you questions. Just got a couple, okay? Okay. Um, you never married Thomas Randolph, right? Correct. You were engaged to him, however, right? Yes. And you had talked about spending the rest of your life with him, correct? Correct. And that relationship didn't work out, right? Right. At the time you guys broke up, he did have life insurance that he was paying a premium for on you, right? I don't know. I had no paperwork. I didn't ever see anything. You, you were aware that life insurance was purchased, correct? 
Purchased, yes. And you agreed with that, correct? Correct. And if Tommy Randolph wanted to keep paying life insurance to profit from something bad to happen to you, he could have done that, right? Right. Okay. As far as you know, when you weren't going to spend the rest of your life together, there wasn't life insurance anymore, as far as you know, correct? I don't know. Okay. Nothing further. Briefly based off of that. So, uh, you remember those questions about you're not sure as to whether or not uh, the premiums existed, correct, after after you moved out, correct? You're correct. Right. Okay. So, just to be clear, none of the paperwork came to your house, is that right? That's right. So you're not sure if you continued to pay the premiums? That's right. Okay. There was a lot of talk about... Um, you know, the split up. Just to be clear, you continued to date him on and off during your marriage, during his marriage to Sharon. Is that right? Yes. And after Sharon passes away, does he come back to visit you? Yes, he does. Does he come back to try to rekindle the relationship? Or at least come back and say, let you know what had happened, but with the intention to, to continue to date? He came back to tell me what happened. Okay. And we never got to the, any other conversation. Understood. No further questions. When he came and told you what had happened in Las Vegas, he was really torn up about it, wasn't he? I don't know how to weigh that. He was very distraught, wasn't he? He was somewhat distraught. Okay. You remember he didn't come running to you and saying, she's gone, I can be in your life forever, correct? Correct. He was very upset that Sharon had been killed, correct? I'm not sure how to answer that. Okay, I think you just did. You told us he was distraught, didn't you? He was kind of distraught. Okay. Do the ladies and gentlemen of the jury have any questions for this witness? Okay, seeing no response, ma'am, you are excused. Thank you very much for your testimony here today. Thank you. Thank you. May I? Yes. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take our lunch recess at this time. During this recess, you must not discuss or communicate with anyone, including fellow jurors, in any way regarding this case or its merits. Either by voice, phone, email, text, internet, or other means of communication or social media. You must not read, watch, listen to news or media accounts or commentary about this case. You must not do any research, such as consulting dictionaries, using the internet, or using reference materials. You must not make any investigation, test the theory of the case, recreate any aspect of the case, or in any other way investigate or learn about the case on your own. And you must not form or express any opinion regarding this case or the comments submitted to you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is 12.25. We will be in recess until 1.40. All rise for the jury.
Hi, Mark. Also, we should address the fire yeah. issues. Yeah. 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 I returned them to Pesci. I was speaking to Vanessa earlier. I'm going to have to get up to the chair today. She was picking up the lunch. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was talking to her earlier. Hey, so I'm gonna go get you. Well, I think I'm catching this tripod, and that's locked. Not very good. She was almost uh, a messenger with the like I don't know. And she had a tickle back to the first one. Yeah. So she had to go robotic, throw a cast in, took it out. Look at the young you. Now you're on the right side of the room. I probably should have told you that. What are you going to think out for? No. They always are. So I built a house 15 years ago. Sold it last year. Rented for a year. And then I just went and bought a house. And now I'm renovating it. Well, renovation has got to be easier than building. <laughs> now, now you got to live it. There's there. Well, I'm not doing the renovation. You can get somebody in there that. <laughs> you find a bunch of dead construction people. I mean, those are the suspects. <laughs> yeah, we did that. Uh, <laughs>
second uh, matter is we would ask that the following evidence be stated in this case. The life insurance on uh, Lizzie, the last witness, I, I see the implication is that he got life insurance on her and that was because he's planning to kill her. And uh, also the boating accident where she had bruises and the maybe half of that concluded he was trying to kill her. And I think those are both propensity evidence, I think it's bad act evidence, and so rather than, uh, I know we've addressed some of these issues, but I would ask that the jury be told to uh, not consider those two matters. Okay. So, Your Honor, with regard to the voting, that already came in on Friday, and we had an explanation for that. Um, and the court previously ruled that all of these witnesses are permitted to um, explain to the jury the advice they gave Sharon Randolph. Um, and based on what she told them, and this was just another example of a friend telling her that uh, she didn't think this was a, a relationship she should stay in. So I don't see that as any different than any of the evidence that already has come in, and the jury already has the context for it that it was uh, deemed an accident by Ms. Randolph, um, you know, because we didn't want the implication that she had bruises on her from some sort of domestic violence incident. With regard to the life insurance um, on Ms. Labrador, I don't get why that would be stricken. It's relevant evidence. Um, it uh, shows uh, what Mr. Uh, Randolph does in his relationships. They've indicated that this is a normal course of conduct. I mean, I guess that's up, up for argument and interpretation um, to the jury. It's certainly not a bad act. It's not illegal. It's just something that occurred. And um, they also cross-examined uh, the witness extensively on it. And I just don't see a basis to strike it. Can I just be yes. briefly heard on that? It is true that Ms. Weckerly told us that that is what Lizzie could say. But they sh the court, I think, the state should have been required to file a bad acts motion and at least let us litigate that beforehand without I submit it. Well, and, or, and, and just alternatively, if the court will not strike it, we'd ask for a mistrial. So we told them that on Friday, so they knew this information um, was com coming all along. They could have they knew she was going to testify Monday and they could have asked to have it excluded. I pers I don't know, I don't think they would have been successful in that because the evidence is, is relevant, but um, they certainly had an opportunity to, to do so. And given that the evidence is relevant and admissible, there's no basis for a mistrial. All right, well, in regards to the voting accident, we did discuss this last week, and as this court deemed, there was actually an um, an explanation given that Sharon Randolph said that this was an accident. That was the purpose for which the court allowed it to be introduced is based on the fact that there would not be any insinuations that there's some sort of domestic violence issue. So no one is going to be permitted to argue that in their closing, but that was clear to everyone last week, so I'm not going to strike that evidence. In regards to the life insurance, when she was testifying about the life insurance, I was actually thinking the same thing, but since it is not a crime, it is not a bad act for somebody to buy life insurance, and actually Mr. Tomchek hinted when he was cross-examining, I don't want to call her Lizzie because I know that's not her um, legal name, but when he was cross-examining her, he actually hinted that people buy life insurance. It's not a crime to buy life insurance. It doesn't insinuate anything one way or another, so... For that reason, it's not a bad act. The state did not have to file a motion in order to bring that in, and that could be argued by either side because that is now evidence that is in front of this jury. So I'm not going to strike that, and I'm also not going to grant a mistrial as I do not believe that forms the basis of a mistrial since that is not a bad act that was elicited by the state. All right, where's Mr. Henry? He's getting the speakers? He's getting the speaker um, because we're going to play the statements with the third witness this afternoon. Okay, but you don't need to speak with this next witness, right? No, I can start. Okay, so we can get started. Okay, that's what I was sorry. I'm sorry if I missed it. All rise for the jury. Please be seated. Uh, the jury's all present and accounted for. 
My name is Carl Klein, that's C-A-R-L-K-L-E-I-N. Thank you. Sir, how are you employed? I'm employed with telephone company Lumen. Um, what do you do for Lumen? Currently, I'm in the manager of the 911 Public manager. Safety Services Group. Manager of 911, I'm sorry? Public Safety Answering Group. Okay. What kind of um, training have you had that allows you to work um, for Lumen in that capacity? I've worked with Lumen for 27 years. I started as a basic technician. I've worked my way up through uh, three different levels of engineering. And then uh, also did some su supervisory work for that group and now ma manager work. Okay. okay, and as the manager, what does that mean you do on a day-to-day -day basis? I oversee the repair group that uh, monitors the 911 network that we provide to different public safety answering points. Okay. Um, would you be the person who manages the 911 associated with um, Las Vegas and the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department? Yes, my group does manage that. Okay, as well as, as well as other metropolitan areas? Oh, hundreds. Hundreds, <laughs> okay. Um, but certainly the one that encompasses Clark County, Las Vegas. Yes. So can you... Um, Explain for the members of the jury what happens when an individual um, calls, you know, picks up the phone and calls 911. What happens on like the Lumen side? On the Lumen side, depending on which company places the phone call, because obviously there could be wireless, cell phone, voice over IP, or landline calls that could go over. Uh, whatever company owns those switches has lines that go to the selective routers which is an aggregation point for 911 calls. And it takes a look at the telephone number that dialed 911 and determines the correct police department to route that call. From there, it'll route the call to that appropriate police department. So when it looks at the number, is it trying to associate that number with a location to determine which police department gets the call routed to them? Yes. Okay. And I think you mentioned in, in your answer that there's some variation, whether it's a landline, a cell phone, or a VOIP? Correct. Um, can you, well, first, can you explain what VOIP is? VOIP is voice over IP phone services. It's a digital, new digital service for phones. Okay. How long has that been around, approximately? Uh, Ten years, at least, maybe longer. Okay. What are the differences in how the system deals with 911 uh, of a landline versus like a cell phone versus VOIP? Uh, there is not much difference. Uh, the main difference is with VoIP or cellular phones, instead of sending the actual telephone number of the caller to the police department, okay. they will send what's called a P ante, pseudo ante. Uh, other abbreviations are ESRKs. <laughs> okay. Uh, multiple. Uh, definitions of that, but uh, they send these pseudo annies, which again is just a telephone number that is built in the database to say if a call comes from that telephone number, it will route the call that's associated with that P annie. Okay, and is that the same thing as like so you're trying to link it to a location? Yes. Okay, does it show up different like at, at metros, the police department's um, 911 <coughs> dispatch if it's a uh, VoIP? wireless or landline, does it? can they see a difference, the dispatcher? Uh, they will after another part of the 911 call is after the police department receives that call and that telephone number. 
It will query Alley database, uh, address location information database. Okay. That provides the calling parties information for that. So with landlines, it'll just give the name of the person that owns that telephone line and their address. With voice over IP, again, it'll show the company that provides the voice over IP service and whatever information they have associated with that call, along with the actual callback number of the caller. Okay. And wireless is basically the same as VoIP. Okay. Where it'll query that database, but they, depending on what era this was, uh, would also provide the information on who's calling, what wireless company is calling, and the uh, location of that caller using typically GPS coordinates. How about, um, is there any, um, like, difference in timing on how quickly any of those methods get to um, the service or get to the... No, they're typically within milliseconds. Okay. So then when, what's the next step after, after the, the person dials the phone and then what happens after that? Uh, the call goes to the selective router over what we call ES trunks. Okay. And they're emergency service trunks and there's a limit to how many trunks from each end office or operating switch okay. that connects to our selective router. The selective router will do that lookup to determine which police department to call routes to. Then once they determine it, we'll send the calls to the police department over what we call EM trunk of emergency management trunks. Okay. And with that call, the phone number and the voice goes to the police department. Uh, their equipment then does that alley bid to determine the address, name, and owner of uh, whoever is calling. Okay. Based on the telephone number that was sent to them. So the, the call first comes into Lumen. Lumen determines what the appropriate police department is based on the sort of location, and then it goes to the police department's um, dispatch, and, and then they can actually see a location that's associated with the number? Correct. Okay. What, um, what, it, what are things that can go wrong um, when someone dials 911? What, what would affect whether a connection is made or lost? Uh, there could be multiple things that could cause a connection to be lost. Uh, typically, there could be trouble with the circuits. As I mentioned, the ES trunks that connect the end office to our selective router. There may be some sort of problem with their circuits, a fiber cut that's impacting the area or where that office is from or other circuit type of things. There's also issues with the circuit that may scramble the telephone number so that when that call goes to our selective router, we will not get the information to properly route the call. Okay. When, it's, um, when there's something wrong with the, the circuit, um, the, the first problem that you mentioned, would that generally then affect a particular like geographical area within um, a city? Uh, typically, yes. Okay. And then the, the second problem that you mentioned, um, would that be like geographically discreet as well, or is that different? It may be a little bit different. Uh, every 911 trunk, in case a telephone number is garbled, has a default police department assigned to it. So any calls that come down that particular 911 trunk will default route to the predetermined police department. Okay. that was uh, agreed upon by the police department and whoever owns the switch. And in that second instance, if it's kind of garbled for one police department, does it end up going to like another uh, police department in the area or is there some sort of like backup for that? There's a possibility it could go to a different police department, but it would get answered. <coughs> I'm sorry? But it would get answered. Okay. It just wouldn't be the right police department. Okay. Um, in, the, in the first instance where you said there could be a circuit problem affecting the area, um, so that would mean the call maybe wouldn't go through and the person would have to uh, reinitiate a call? Yes. Um, are there, I think you touched on this, but are there, um, I guess like within the, when you build a 911 system, um, are there sort of factors in the building that account for how busy or how many 911 calls an agency might get? Yes, typically when we engineer a 911 network, we try to establish what's called a .01 grade of service, which is a standard that indicates during an average busy hour or average day, only one out of 100 calls may overflow to a busy signal. Okay. I'm sorry, say that number again, one? 
one out of 100. Okay, in the case, uh, so it's able to handle all of those, so maybe if 100 people call in at once, one will get a busy signal? Uh, not necessarily like that, but it's, the formula is written so that on an average busy day, I see. Uh, only one out of 100 911 calls would go to a busy signal. Okay. And would that be like in the case of sort of a catastrophic, like a big event that occurs in a metropolitan area? Yes, that could be a possibility where you have several hundred, several thousand people not trying to dial 911 okay. at the same time. And um, if, if a person is like that one in the hundred, um, do you know what type of uh, signal they receive, do they receive like literally that beep, 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 busy signal, or do you know if they get a recording? Uh, it would be one or the other. I'm not sure specifically which one they would get in that okay. instance. Okay. Would that depend on the agency? Yes. And how many, in uh, for the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, how many routers are there for each of the various methods of calling in? Uh, there are two selective routers that we utilize. Uh, they're built for redundancy, so in the event one fails, calls can complete over the other selective router. Okay. Um, thank you, sir. I'll pass the witness runner. How are you doing, Mr. Klein? Good, sir. You've worked in this business with Lumen for 27 years. Yes, sir. Um, jobs changed a lot over the years, sounds like, for you personally, right? Yes. You'd also agree with me that technology's changed a lot in those 27 years, right? Yes, it has. I'm assuming in the training that you've received in the last almost three decades, you've probably learned a little bit about the history of the 911 system. Yes. Okay. Um, didn't always have 911 in the United States, correct? Correct. Uh, first came into being in the early 70s, right? I believe so, yes. Okay. Um, and it's not until like 1998 that Senate Bill 800 signed by President Clinton that makes it the national number. You agree with that? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay, you just don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Um, if I were to represent that to you, you wouldn't have any basis to dispute that, would you? I don't know the answer, so I couldn't tell you one way or the other. Okay. I want to talk about what you focus on on the Lumen side of things. Um, you have a responsibility and you have a team that works with you and you want to make sure and maintain a system that if I pick up my phone in an emergency and dial 911, somebody is going to answer it on the other end, right? Yes, sir. Um, you would agree with me in order to route the call from one of the routers that you have serving the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, the call has to get there first, right? Get to the selective router? Yes. Yes. Okay. Back in way up to when 911's in its infancy, all the 911 calls that came in were over like a hard landline, right? Yes. Like the old school phones that we had where there was actually a wire coming to our house that would take that transmission, correct? Yes, sir. Eventually, there are other methods of communication that are developed as technology changes, right? Yes, sir. And you'd agree with me that as you sit here today in 2023, the technology is a lot more stable, accurate, and reliable than it was like in the 80s or 90s, right? I would say it's just as stable. The new technologies just have added additional information and another way for different types of services to connect. But the basic E911 network, which has been in place since, like you said, that late 80s, 90s, uh, that's been pretty stable f for the whole time. Right. The E911 network, once a call gets in and it gets out, right? Correct. Okay. Let's talk about circumstances where maybe a call doesn't get in, okay? Okay. If I'm hiking up in, do you, are you, do you live in Las Vegas? No, sir. Okay. You familiar with Las Vegas at all? Have I what? Are you familiar with Las Vegas at all? Not really. Okay. There's a place out west of town called Red Rock Canyon. You can go hiking out there, there's mountains, there's no cell service when you get up in those mountains. Can you appreciate that? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's say I go hiking out there and I fall down and break my leg, and I want to call 911. I hit 911 on my cell phone, the call never makes it to your router, right? That's a possibility, yes. Right. So I might be calling 911 and your equipment with Lumen is sitting there waiting for it to come in, they just can't get it. Fair? Yes, sir. Okay. 
Between old-fashioned landlines and the cellular telephone example I just gave you, there's a technology referred to a few different ways a few different times on direct examination. If I say VoIP, you know what I mean, right? I believe so, yes. Voice over, over and IP. you put it IP. Yep. The IP stands for Internet Protocol, right? Correct. Okay. Certainly you can understand and appreciate that the Internet has gotten a lot better between, say, the year 2000 and the year 2023. You know that, right? Yes. Okay. Voice over Internet Protocol is a call system where I have a subscription with some subscriber. Like, let me give you a name. You ever heard of Vonage? Yes. Vonage is a voice over Internet Protocol subscriber, right? Yes, I believe so. Yeah. So, like, back in the 90s, 1998 to be exact, Vonage came into existence. Were you aware of that? No. Were you aware that between 1998 and 2003, Vonage didn't even offer 911 services to its subscribers? No, I don't. Okay. Would that surprise you? I don't know how to answer that. No, I don't. Okay. You don't really have any meaningful testimony to give us about the history and the accuracy of Vonage as a voice over internet protocol provider, right? No. You can just tell us what happens when a call actually gets there, right? Gets to our selective router from that provider, yes. Okay, so let's say it's 2008, and I have a Vonage service in my house. I no longer have a landline. That's my service provider to make an outgoing phone call. There were a lot of people like that, right? I don't know how many. Okay. Would it surprise you that there are people that had a subscription through Vonage and didn't have an old-fashioned landline? No, that wouldn't surprise me. Right. And if Vonage, the voiceover internet protocol provider, goes out and they pick up their phone to make a call, not going to get to your routers, right? Correct. Okay. You mentioned some circumstances where a busy signal might be obtained by someone trying to dial 911. Remember that? Yes, sir. And you agree with me that if you're shooting for it in a perfect scenario, one out of 100 calls doesn't get through, statistically speaking. Do you agree with that? Yes. Okay. During a busy hour. Yeah, so even in the circumstance where everything's working the way that you want it to, the service providers are getting those calls out, they're coming to your routers, even in those circumstances, one out of 100 might not work, right? During a busy hour, yes. Okay. And during a non-busy hour, if my service provider is Vonage and I pick up my phone to utilize it, and Vonage is out, my Internet's out, my voice over Internet protocol provider isn't allowing me to complete calls, not going to get to you at all, right? Correct. So in that circumstance, 100 out of 100 aren't going to get through. Agreed? From the Vonage point of standing, yes. Okay. Um, you're familiar with different types of busy signals, aren't you? Yes. There is what we call like the old-fashioned busy signal where I call a number and maybe someone's on the other line and it gives kind of a slow, steady beeping sound, right? Correct. There's also a fast busy signal, right? Correct. What causes that? Typically some sort of network failure. So it I, would cause that type of busy to... Right. So hypothetically, I pick up a telephone to dial 911 and I have Vonage. I might have a deadline, right? Possibly, yes. And if I call back again, the system's down, I might get a fast busy signal, right? I don't know what Vonage would provide if their network is down. But you'd agree with me, if their network is down, they wouldn't provide any call routing to Lumen, right? I would agree with that. Okay. You'd accept the possibility that a system can go down momentarily, right? Yes. Like I'm in the middle of a phone call with a voiceover internet protocol provider like Vonage, and the system goes out, the call is just gone, right? That could be a possibility. Okay. And then later, system might come back online. You understand that's how that works, right? Yes, sir. It could happen. And then my phone could work, right? Possibly, yes. And it's also extremely possible that if my system's out, I try a call a couple times, by the time I try it the third, fourth, fifth time, maybe I get through, right? That could be a possibility. That's not crazy at all, is it? It could be a possibility. Nothing further, right. um, Sir, when you talked about um, how the system is sort of calibrated, um, so I think you said in a busy hour, one in a hundred would like sort of calling at the same time would get the busy signal, as you recall that? Correct. Okay, and that's assuming like everybody making a call all at once? Possibly, yes. Okay. Is, is, are you any more likely to get the busy signal 
um, depending on what kind of method you're using, like landline, cell, or uh, VoIP. All those companies should be connecting to the e the 911 network with that same PL1 rate of service. That's kind of the Danina specs for what's acceptable. Okay. And um, all of that is sort of predicated on the idea that, like, there are just some instances where you could have a really busy situation in a city and, you know, things can go wrong a little bit in terms of the connection? Correct. Um, and... If you, if you do get that call, or if you are making a call, um, I think Mr. Tomchek was asking, you know, if you're in the middle of the call, then you would be able to call back and possibly get the connection after that? Yes, that could be a possibility. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the jury has any questions for this witness? Seeing no response, sir, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. My name is Mark Bartlett, M A R K B A R T L E T T. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, sir, are you, are you familiar with the address of 5200 Dana Springs? Yes, sir, that's where I reside. Okay, so you still live there to this day? Yes, I do. Were you living there on May 8, 2008? Yes. Okay. What I'd like to do is, Your Honor, by stipulation, the parties have stipulated to states propose 1 and 2 being admitted into evidence, 316 being admitted into evidence, 313, 312, and 311. That's correct. So 311 to 313, <coughs> and 316? 313, 311, 312, 316, and exhibits 1 and 2. Okay. Those are all the admitted pursuit stipulations. Thank you very much. Sir, if I could, may I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes. Thank you very much. You said uh, you lived at 5200 Dana Springs. Correct? Yes, correct. All right. I want to show you first exhibit 313. Do you see your home there? <clears throat> yes, right here in the corner. Okay. And are you, if we look at states 312, is this kind of from the vantage point diagonally looking out from your house? Yes. Okay. And you're familiar with a home at 6517 Rancho Santa Fe, correct? Yes. I want to show you Exhibit 1. Is that that home? Yes. Exhibit 2, is that another example of that home? Just yes. A little bit closer up. And is that the home there, kind of between these two palm trees? Yep. And for the reference, I was showing Exhibit 312. Lastly, I want to show you States 311. Is this an overhead map showing your house in 6517 Rancho Santa Fe? Yep. Okay. And this is all kind of fair and accurate depictions of all these locations. Yep. Okay. Um, this time I'd like to switch over to the overhead. Oh, no. Uh, you can, you okay, can, I'm not going to. I can't remember. Just hit the big blue button. Um, thank you, Mark. First one to publish, 313. 
You had indicated this was your home, is that correct? When you yes, look correct. At it? Publishing 312. This is a vantage point from your house looking in the direction of 6, 6517 uh, Rancho Santa Fe, is that right? Yes. And you had indicated it was this house between the two palm trees? Correct. Publishing 311. This is an overhead, and I'll zoom out. This is an overhead of, of your house and 6517 Rancho Santa Fe. Yes. And you had indicated publishing one. This is the 6517 Rancho Santa Fe house. Correct. And publishing two, this is also another picture of that home. Yes. Okay. I want to turn your attention um, to that evening, probably um, around, I don't know, eight, eight, 8 o'clock at night, something along those lines. What were you doing that night? I was working on my car in the garage, the okay. trunk area. Okay. What type of car were you working on? A, a 63 Chevy Impala. All right. Uh, when you were working on that car, was your garage door up? Yes, it was. Was your car... In the garage? Was it in the driveway? Where where was it? My car is pretty long, and and it, you know it, it like fits in there exactly. And I was like laying into the trunk, All right. like across the batteries, and I was working on it. Around eight thirty, is there something that catches your attention that kind of causes you to look away from working on your car? Yeah, when uh, when somebody pulls up, I I get up to see who it is, and and I notice it was a. The, across a, the neighbor lady waiting to get into a garage. Okay, and when you say the neighbor lady, are you talking about... That's objection to leaving. Well, I haven't suggested the answer. Okay. When you said the neighbor lady, what home are you referring to? The, the one, the 65... Publishing to. This home? Yeah, the 6517, yes. All right, so you saw... So you saw a car pull in around that time? Yes, I saw a car pull in. Um, did the car go all the way into the garage? Yes, it did. What happened next with the garage door? The garage door closed. All right, did you watch it close? Yes. Okay. What's the next thing you remember happening after that garage door closes? Well, at, at the same time, uh, my friend called me when I was standing outside of, of the garage, you know, and I got up to look to see who it was. My friend called at the exact same time, and I was on the phone with him. Okay. And what was the name of your friend? Alex Mercado. All right. So you're on the phone with your friend, Alex, and then what happens? I hear gunshots. Coming from what direction? From the 6517. How many gunshots do you hear? Three rapid gunshots, mm -hmm. like bang, bang, bang. Okay. Then a, a little pause, and another shot. A pause, another shot, a pause, shot. Okay, so you hear three in quick succession, some pauses and shots after that. Yes. Um, do, you, do you say anything? Do you react? What do you do at that point? I told my friend, oh, it sounds like they're shooting. I wasn't, you know, 100% sure. I said, oh, it sounds like they're shooting. So I said, I'll call you back. Okay. So I went, uh, I didn't hear, not, no screaming, no yelling. Nothing, so I went back to work in, okay. in my trunk. If you heard screaming or yelling, would you have done something? Yeah, I, I probably would have called the police. Okay. So then you don't kind of hear anything, but you tell your friend Alex, man, I'm hearing gunshots. Yes. And then um, at some point, do the police arrive? Uh, yeah, in about 20 minutes, the, the police showed up, a lot of police. Okay. Okay. Um, Eventually, do you speak to police officers about um, what you heard and saw? Yes. Okay. Do you provide police officers um, with the phone number of your friend, Alex? Yes, I do. And was that phone number 702-557-2752? Yes. Okay. I think at some point, do you even offer to provide copies of your records to them if they yes. need them? Okay. I'm going to approach with what's been admitted as Exhibit 316. I'm going to turn to page two, three of this document. 
I want you to look at right here. Is that Alex's phone number? Yes. Can you tell me, just read off, that's a 24 hour clock, but can you read off what the time is there? Okay. Looks like 8, uh, 33. Okay, but it says 20, 33, just yeah. technically? Yeah, 20, 33, yes. Okay, but if you could convert the 12 hours yeah. to 8, 33. 8, 33. Publishing 316. Please read out what that day is. 5-8-2008. Please read out that time. 2033. Whose phone number is that? I'd ask you to say the complete number, please. Okay. Please read out. 20, Go ahead. 2033-36. Uh, please read out that phone number. 702-249-0807. Is that your phone number? Yes, it is. Okay. And that's just a repeat of your same number, correct? Correct. And then, and is this Alex's number? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I have no further questions for this witness. Critical yeah. believe you for How you doing? So, how long had you lived at that house? Since 94. Since 1994. So you, you, and you still live there? Yes. So you've lived there a long time? Yes. You know the neighborhood? Yes. And uh, it's fair to say that you uh, told the police on the night in question what you'd heard? Yes. Okay. And fair to say that, you know, way back when, when you were talking about this, your memory was probably, you know, very fresh as to what happened. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Correct. And so what drew your attention, let's, let's set this up. You're working on your car, right? Yes. Okay. And you have a call with your friend. You're, you're talking to your friend at some point. Yes. I'm going to show you that phone, that call, okay? Do you see that, the call in orange on there, or yellow? Yes. Okay, so... You're talking to your friend, and you said the time. You, you actually put it in, took it away from uh, 2033, and you made it. It's 8.33 p.m. and 36 seconds. That's when it starts. Yes. Okay. It, well, at least that's what the record show. Is that, is that true? Yes, correct. And the call that you have with your friend lasts for about 270 seconds, a little over four minutes. Yeah. Okay. You don't dispute that at all, do you? Now, while you're on this call at 8.33, 36 seconds, and talking to your friend, you notice the neighbor's vehicle show up and start to go into the garage. That was before uh, my friend, the neighbor, put in the garage and I got the call at the same time. Okay, so what you're saying is that simultaneously you see the neighbor's car and yeah, I, I get up, I hear the neighbor's car, I get up, see what it is, and then just right then my neighbor, I mean, my friend Alex called me. Okay. And do you remember previously at a prior proceeding saying you were on the phone and the car pulled up? Do you no. remember saying that? No. If I showed you a copy of 
uh, prior proceedings and what you testified to. Would that refresh your memory? Uh, yeah, probably. Okay. Page from uh, prior proceedings, page 93 and 94. Yes. So I want to go through this really carefully so that we can see exactly mm -hmm. what you said. Okay, if you could just read to yourself page 93 where you start with saying you're talking to your friend and your friend's name is Alex. Is that right? <clears throat> yeah. Okay. And then just read to yourself 93, please. And let me know when you're done. Yeah. Okay. And I'm going to turn to 94 and just ask you to read a portion of that, too. Do you have a chance to review that, sir? Yep. Okay. It appears that what you said was that you were on the phone with Alex and that you saw the car that show up, right? Yeah, at the same, the same time. Okay. So what you're saying, so, you know, is just basically that I'm on the phone, I see the neighbor's car show up. You know, basically the car pulled up, the phone at the same time. Okay. And that's, that's it. Okay. And do you remember that when the car pulled up, the neighbor car pulled up, the garage door opened. You yes. Explain that, right? Yeah. And you didn't see anybody get out. You said you saw the car just go in. Yeah, the car just went in. Nothing. No reason to really pay attention to much of this. It's just normal, everyday. Yeah. Neighbors coming. Yeah, neighbors come and go. Yeah, okay. Talking on the phone. And then you say you watch the door close. The yep. Garage door close. Yeah. Okay. And then you said that about 25 to 30 seconds after that. After the garage door closes, you hear shots. Yes. Okay. So if we understand this correctly, you're on the phone, you're saying at about 8.33, 36, simultaneously with the calls at the beginning, yeah. you see the car show up. Yeah. Right? So we know, we can tell from this that the neighbor car shows up around pretty close to 8.33, 36, approximately. Yeah. Right? So, yes? Yeah. Somewhere around there, yeah. And the garage door opens, the neighbor car goes in, right? Yeah, correct. And then the garage door closes. Correct. And after that, 25 to 30 seconds go by, we hear shots, you hear shots. Yeah. Okay. You told the jury that today, and you, in a prior proceedings, told the judge that. Fair to say? Yes. And that's what happened. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. Now, I know it's been a while, okay? And so, you, you at first, you've told us today, from what I can tell, you heard three rapid shots. Yes, right? correct. Do you, and then you, there was a pause, and then a shot, a pause, then a shot, a pause, and a shot. Yes. Total six shots. Uh, six or seven shots. I'm, I can't re recollect. It's been a while. Okay, fair enough. Do you remember previously in a prior proceeding saying you thought there were four shots? I, I, I can't recollect. Okay. And again, it, it's been a long time. You're trying the best you can, right? Yeah. Yeah. If I showed you a copy of what you said before, a transcript of when you described four shots, would that help refresh your memory? Yeah. Okay. Page 11, and specifically line, page 11, page 16, and I'm going to be showing him page, line 10 through 17 of, of, line, of page 11. May I approach up? Yes. Okay, I'm going to show you where you testified under oath previously, and you were asked how many shots you heard, and if you could read lines 10 through 17 to yourself. Let me know when you're done, sir. Are you done? 
Yeah. I'm also going to show you again another page where you're asked about the number of shots. Page 16, Council. And if you could just read to yourself uh, lines 11 through 16. Have you had a chance to review that? Yes. Okay. Does that refresh your memory as to the fact that at one point you, you said that there were in fact four shots? Yeah. So, again, fair to say, it's been a long time, you're doing the best you can. You're telling us today it was six shots, a while back you were saying it was four, right? Yeah. You could, you know, obviously be mistaken as to exactly what you heard, is that right? Uh, no, there's no mistake in gunshots. Okay, no, I, I, I misspoke then. I don't mean that you didn't hear gunshots. I meant that today you described six shots, but back then... Yeah, back then I, I, was, hit. I was just saying, you know, what happened. You're doing the best you could. Yeah. Okay. People are asking you to remember how many bang, bang, bangs you heard. Yeah. It can be kind of difficult. Is that fair to say? Yeah. You didn't call the police when no, you heard this. I did not. Do you remember the night the police talked to you, you told them that you thought maybe it was firecrackers? Yeah, I may say it was kids or something, you know, you know play around, right. stuff like that. But then you also have said that you knew they were, somebody was blasting. You kind of said, yeah. you know, you've been around. I think you even described it. Look, I, yeah. I, I'm a little streetwise, I know what I, I know gunshots when I hear it. Correct? Yeah, yeah it's correct. And you told your friend they're blasting. And, you know, when you hear them blasting, it probably caused that end of that phone call. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I said I'll, I'll call you back. Okay. So once you heard the blasting, you told your friend, I'm going to call you back, just to make sure you're safe and everything. Yeah, there's no kids heard any screaming or anything like that. Okay, I'm going to again show you the phone records, okay? So at 8.33, 36, you start this phone call, you see the vehicle come in, correct? Yes. And that phone call lasts 270 seconds, and towards the end of it, you're telling your friend, hey, look, i got to go, they're blasting, right? There? Yeah, we're during the call, yeah. And, you know, we went over 270 seconds is about, what, 4 minutes, 30 seconds. So, so somewhere that the call would have ended around 8.38. You see that? You do the math, it's about 8.38. Yeah. You also said today that you thought police showed up about 20 minutes later. Yeah. Okay, again, you, you, you didn't have a watch, you're not timing how fast the police show up. It's just, you try to do the best you can. Is that right? Yeah, just a guesstimation. Okay. So you would have thought sometime, it, just in your, as you call it, guesstimation, sometime 20 minutes after 8.38, the police are going to arrive, right? That's what you thought. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Concludes cross-examination. Were you right, Mr. During our cross-examination, you were asked about the timing of seeing that garage door close and then hearing the shots. Do you remember that? Yes. And, and, and you believe, I think you had said, you heard the shots just a few seconds after the garage door closed. Is that right? <clears throat> yeah. No, Judge. It was pretty quick. 30 seconds, I would ask you not to leave. And, and that is not what the testimony was. Okay. Well, there was a lot of questions back and forth about whether it was at the same time. So this jury will remember the testimony as they remember it to be. Okay. Well, then, how about this? Uh, I'm just going to read for completeness, page 94 of the prior proceeding. Well, you're not going to read it into the record because it didn't say you didn't remember. Okay. Well, 
What did you say? What do you remember saying at the prior proceeding about how long after the garage door closed did you think you heard the gunshots? It was. It was. I thought it was right away. You know, probably like 10, 15, 20 seconds. I thought it was right away. Okay. Did you state previously it was like right away? I would say within 20 to 30 seconds. Yes. Okay. Judge, if you could just, I think Mr. Hammond just made a mistake. If you could just read that sentence correctly. Well, I'm sure we didn't read it directly. Okay, I'll read it. I'll read it again. Page 94, lines 18 and 19. It was like right away. I would say within 20, 30 seconds. I'm sorry, what did I say? Sorry, that's my fault. I didn't read it. I didn't read it wrong. My, my apologies. All right, 25, 30 seconds. Okay. So you believed it was right away after seeing that garage door closing? Yes. Okay. And was this at the beginning of your phone call with your friend? Yeah. Okay. And you said this happened around 20 minutes later the police show up? Yeah. Okay, so if your call started at 8.33, if you add 20 minutes, that would put it at about 8.53 at night. Yes. Okay. Thank you. No further questions. None. All right. Do the ladies and gentlemen have any other questions for this witness? Okay. Oh, ma'am, if you could write your question and make sure you use your jury number, not your badge number. We've switched over. I'm sorry. I swear I won't give you another number. Remember. <laughs> not so much. <laughs> No, I did not. Okay. Steve, do you have any follow-up based on the jury question? No, Your Honor. Ms. Warren? No, Your Honor. Okay. Did you let the jury have any further questions for this witness? Okay. Seeing my phone, sir, you're excused. Thank you very much for Thank your testimony here today. So, on the next witness, Your Honor, we'll be playing a video. I think we need to set up the speakers, but then we can roll. Okay, you're playing video when he starts. It was your... Oh, well, I would like a chance to test out the audio, and it would be hard to do with the 12 members in the box. All right. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have to take a brief recess so we can make sure we have all the audio equipment set up for you. During this recess, you must not discuss or communicate with anyone, including the federal jurors, in any way regarding this case or its merits, either by voice, phone, email, text, internet, or other means of communication or social media. You must not read, watch, or listen to the media accounts or commentary about this case. You must not do any research, such as consulting dictionaries, using the internet, or using reference materials. You must not make any investigation, test the theory of the case, recreating the aspect of the case, or any other way to investigate or learn about the case on your own. You must not form or express anything in regard to this case or its comments. Thank you. Hey, gentlemen, it is 2 40. We'll be in recess until 2 50. Bye. All rise for the jury. Hey, camera's starting to roll.
good or bad? Yeah. That was bad. <laughs> <laughs>
Is that Sam? I don't know. Sam, we're going to have to end up. Oh, I want to see somebody. 20 minutes to, to the driver and then start the actual.
be seated. Your Honor, the jury's all present. Let me go back on the record and see 35 years, I was with Metro for 21 and a half, or 27 and a half, and the last 20 years I was assigned to the homicide section. And when did you retire? Last Thursday. <laughs> so it hasn't been a week. No. <laughs> no. Um, you were employed uh, at homicide in May of 2008. That's correct. Um, in, over the span of your career, um, how many crime scenes do you think you've been to? Six to nine hundred. Okay. And of the of those is how many would be homicides? Oh, homicides would have been six to seven hundred minimum. Okay. And then crime scenes in general? I couldn't even begin to tell you. Over thirty five years, hundreds. Okay. And prior to homicide, where were you assigned? Uh, when I first came to uh, Metro, I was in patrol. Uh, from there, I went to a problem-solving unit. After that, I was assigned to the career criminal section for about a year. After that, I went to robbery for about three years and then the homicide section. Can you explain to the members of the jury um, how uh, homicides are investigated, the way the rotation works amongst uh, the detectives? So with the Metro Police Department, we currently have 24 detectives assigned to homicide. So there's four squads, six detectives in each squad, and a sergeant. We have a lieutenant that oversees the entire section. Uh, when a call for a murder comes in, within each squad, there are three two-man teams. So the, the rotation just goes, if you pick up a murder, this rotation, then the other two guys on the squad will pick up one the next time, and then the next time, the next two will have one. So it's kind of, it's just random, sort of, once you get a case, that team goes down and then the next team takes the next case. That's correct. Um, were you a part of the group that responded to 6517 Rancho Santa Fe Drive on May the 8th of 2008? I was. And do you recall approximately what time it was that you got there? So the actual 911 call was 845 PM. Uh, by the time the officers secured the scene, uh, detectives from the general assignment section or major crimes goes out there. They start to get things ready for a brief and they call us. Uh, I believe that we got there somewhere in the area of 10 o'clock, maybe a little bit after that PM. Okay. And amongst homicide detectives, wherever you happen to be at that time, you're notified of a homicide. And if it's um, your turn to respond, then that group then just shows up at the scene individually? That's correct. Um, in this case, it was <clears throat> my lieutenant, uh, Lou Roberts, my sergeant, Rocky Alby, and then there was four detectives, myself, uh, Dan Long, Dino Kelly, and my partner, Ken Hardy. Um, and I think you touched on this in an earlier answer, but once, uh, by the time homicide is there, patrol has already re uh, responded and locked down the scene, essentially? That's correct. And they would have 
they're responsible for putting up tape and making sure the scene isn't disturbed after they sort of clear it for safety reasons? Yes. Um, when uh, you arrived, um, were there any medical personnel there? I don't believe so. They had already gone by then. Okay. And so what was your, what was your responsibility with regard to this investigation, primarily? So the first thing that um, the squad does once we arrive is we decide who's going to do what, who's going to do the crime scene investigation. Uh, in this case, that was Detective O'Kelly. And then the other detectives would be assigned various jobs, whether it's to interview witnesses, uh, interview potential suspects. In this case, uh, myself and Detective Hardy, my partner, were assigned to interview Thomas Randolph. And where, do you remember where Mr. Randolph was when you responded on the 8th? I believe he was in the back of a patrol car. Okay. And um, did you approach Mr. Randolph to see if he would be willing to um, be interviewed or talk to yourself and Detective Hardy? I did. Um, once I arrive and we get briefed, I always make it a habit to go up and talk to the people that I need to interview just to introduce myself and my partner and let them know what's going to be going on from there on. At, um, at that time, or either before or after that, would you walk the scene and, and make any observations prior to doing the interview? Yes. And did you do that in this case? We did. Um, how long do you spend on that initial walkthrough? So prior to doing the walkthrough, uh, I believe I met with Mr. Randolph and obtained his consent to search his residence and explained to him what I was looking for uh, and what I needed his consent to seize. And he consented to the search? He did. Okay. And so then you walked the scene with other detectives? Yes. And what were your observations just generally of the scene? So just looking um, at the front door, I didn't notice any obvious signs of forced entry into the residence. Um, when I got inside, there didn't appear to be any ransacking in the living room area. Uh, we walked back into the hallway, which runs north and south between the garage and then the master bedroom, which was on the south side of the house. And I noticed lying in the hallway in a supine or face-up position was a white female victim who was bleeding. Um, her head was closest to the entryway to the master bedroom. And she was lying on the tiled floor uh, between what would later be identified as a music room and then the bathroom. And then as I walked out toward the garage on the north side of that hallway, there was an African-American male who was lying on his right side against a refrigerator uh, in that garage area. Okay. And so you would have walked through the scene, made those observations, and then at some point after that, do you and Detective uh, Hardy uh, meet with Mr. Randolph at Homicide? We do. Okay. Um, and is he taken there by you or by patrol, or do you remember? I don't recall if we gave him a ride to the office. I know we gave him a ride from the office back to his residence, but he may have been taken to the office by patrolmen. I don't remember. Okay. And when you get to the homicide um, offices, it's just yourself and Detective Hardy who interview him at first? That's correct. And do you remember approximately what time it was the interview may have started, or would it be time stamped on the? Uh, it will be on the video. Uh, it should also be on the audio. But um, I know that if I obtained consent to search his house at approximately 11 p.m., that it would have probably been close to midnight, maybe a few moments after midnight into the morning of the 9th. Okay. When he was doing this interview with you sort of from the 8th into the 9th, um, was he in custody or was he free to leave? He was not in custody. He could end the interview whenever he wanted. He was not read Miranda because at that point he was not a suspect. He was merely the relative of one of the victims, the female victim. Okay. Um, and, Your Honor, um, well, actually, Detective, I should ask you first. Um, that interview was recorded? It was. And transcribed? Yes. Um, Your Honor, that interview is memorialized in State's uh, Proposed 314, which I move to admit and publish now. No objection.
Have her own cell? Or? Yeah. What was that number? Uh, they don't know it's on my cell phone. I just call it. Okay. Actually, tonight my cell phone. Uh, I guess I left it in the kitchen or somewhere because I didn't have it. But she called me and told me she was about ready to go from the you know in the casino. She had lost or was looking for me or whatever. <clears throat> what time did you guys leave the house this evening? Just. Probably right around six few minutes after, because she called me just as I was up the street and told me to hurry up, we're going to be late. She said, I asked if everything was ready, the kids was ready, because we had to drop one of the, uh, our grandson off. So the grandson was staying at the house? Um, he came over and was swimming after school. He's autistic. And we, if he does go to school, that's kind of his reward. Oh. What's his name? Nicholas. It's, I don't, I don't know, I've learned that the day a couple of times, it's some Italian name, but Bayer is my stepbrother's name, new married name. And where did you drop Nicholas off at? At his mom's. Just taking the car share and one end, something about the Thomas the other way. He puked on the couch and couldn't get the car clear that we took over to work or something. <coughs> What's your daughter's name again? My daughter's name. And where are you dropping Nicholas off? Uh, Sharon's daughter, Colleen, C O L L E E N, Buyer. B E Y E R. <coughs> and where did you drop the Nicholas off? That where is Colleen live? Um, Roughly. Severance? Does that make Elkhorn or Severance or something like that? It's on the other side of 215 if you go to Jones. Okay. And then. Um, so you left the house around 6, take Nicholas off, drop him off at Colleen's, and then what time did you leave Colleen's house? Approximately. Five minutes later. If you even had two, three minutes. And where'd you go then? To uh, the charcoal 
state of Vermont. It was called the State House, of, excuse me, the Santa Fe. Chicken and lobster for her Mother's Day. Just driving time in from Colleen's to Santa Fe or just stop somewhere else? No, no. Just straight to What time did you leave the Santa Fe? David, I think we got gas. I think we got gas on the way. I can't remember. Yeah, we did. We got gas just around the corner at that mobile. Because we were leaving early in the morning as she said the gas would go up there, which probably will. And that's the mobile station by the Santa Fe? Uh, or up by Colleen's? No, it's, it's by our house there. Um, when you go around that corner, I think it's a mobile station. It's something And then you went to the charcoal room. Uh -huh. What time did you leave there? Uh, just a few minutes before the 911 thing. You know, just as long as it took to get there. And Yeah. Okay, yeah. 
So you got the Kawasaki dealer on one side. Yeah, no, that's the best of us. Yeah. We went in there and was in there probably half hour, 45 minutes, in and out, looking at the... Because I told him I was going to maybe buy two jet skis this weekend. I was going to go check one out and see if it beat my back too bad. If it did, then maybe buy it one share it, so I wanted to get some. What time did you get back home? Just within minutes of six. And was uh, Mike with you when you got back home? No, I dropped him off at the... There's a gas station, not a gas station. We was coming back and just wanted to go to his girlfriend's, but I didn't have time to do that. I'd buy a... Where all the dopers hang out, the casino, one of the station casinos, but there's a hotel up there. Fiesta, yeah. Texas. Where there's the Texas, the Fiesta, and then right across the street is like a budget suite. Okay, yeah, the, the, that's where we wanted to go. It was up there. He says he could get a ride from there, and I just told him I didn't have time to take him that far. And he said, let's go just catch the bus. There's one over by a car wash. And I just pulled in and got out, and that was it. I turned around and came home. And I'm assuming he walked over and got it. You know, there's a bus thing over there, so I'm assuming he's not too far from there. It's probably where he went, but I don't know. Did, um, did he have a key to the house? Not that he, he did at one time, but not to my knowledge, he didn't. You said you did it one time. Did you have the box changed? Or? No, he, what happened is he, uh, I had, we had a bunch of keys turned out all these damn keys in the wall, and they hadn't fixed nothing. I mean, they hadn't fixed it. And uh, the uh, mailbox key broke, so we were in a mailbox broke, and the mailman told us they just leave it open, and we could buy a new lock and save 50 bucks. So we had a bunch of old keys like that. And, um, I had a bunch of old keys just from different houses, but we went through them, they didn't fit nothing, so I put a bunch of them away. And uh, he said he found one and gave it to us, and I threw it up on the, um, before we left, he said he had, I had found the key, and it wasn't his, and said that, well, I didn't say it was ours, he just said he found the key, and I said, well, bring it over, it might be the one I lost for the floor, because we got two made, we had a bunch made, but they didn't work. They're not quite long enough. And uh, um, we keep it for the kids in the swimming pool. We're afraid they'll get in it. So it's got one of the double, you got to have a key for both sides. So when they're, when they're there, we take it out and lay it up on top of the uh, light there. But Nicholas is, even though he's autistic, he's getting pretty smart. So we had another one, and I it this is shit too. And a lot of times I'll just leave it in my pocket, I'll forget her leave it in the door of the shed, but he said he had found one, and I know we have two, because we, quite often we can't afford the door, because we can't find the fucking key, and it's, because one of us put it, Sharon is just really forgetful, she is, but, when was that, did you get it back to you? Uh, before we left. Today? No, no, uh, before we left for Utah, over a week ago or so. And I insisted that he bring it over. And he brought it over. He said he'd come get it right now if you want, but it was like late at night. He's messing up his spring over in the morning. Let me see if it fits. And he brought it over. And it fit. One of the hardest money. I told him I just didn't have any, which wasn't true. I did, but he just getting further and further in debt. At first, he was good about borrowing and paying a bag. How much did he owe you? Yeah, three, four hundred bucks, maybe. <coughs> But he's just got his, well, I'm assuming he just did it, because like I said, I, I don't know. Uh, he had, was taking a class for masonry, you know, to come up. What is it? Um, journeyman or something, union, to become in the union. And uh, he would go to work and stuff down there, and, and actually show them a piece of paper that says report on such and such day to get your card. 
And he said, once he got his car, he'd be making some good money, so he was going to put some brick in the back because they are building new houses back behind our house and shared this room naked, which wasn't a problem until the house next door sold and then they started building those. So he was going to put the brick in for us and so I loaned him a little money and you know, figured he'd just come off the brick at the end. And he works and he goes over our house all the time. I mean, he's, he's a really always working. I mean, he's not very really good at what he does, but he's there. You know, you can, you can usually, if he says he'll be there at 10, he'll be there at 10 to work and stuff. And it's just been easier. So who might have been? I'm paranoid about the Mexicans hiring these Mexicans to move in and out, move things around, and, and uh, you know, to work in the house. And, and um, like I said, he just, he, I like him. He's like a really nice guy. I mean, he talked a lot of gang shit and stuff, but, you know, from other states, Florida, and wherever he's from. Um, and I think he has some warrants out, but I don't know. Okay. So who knew you were going out this evening? Um, Colleen, Mike, uh, uh, everybody Sharon's a phone bug to everybody that talked on the phone, you know, I'm sure she told them. But nobody that was in our house that she talked on the phone was there. <clears throat> All right, what I want to do is um, just take a tape statement, see if we can uh, get all this transcribed and have a further report. All right, we'll just cover um, basically what we just talked about, you know, the, how long you've known Mike, how you met him, um, and we'll go into what happened this evening. Operators, Detective Seymour, PM 5096, conducting a witness interview under W0805-08-3131. Name of the person given the statement last name is Randolph, R-A-N-D-O-L-P-H, first name Thomas, middle name Williams, white male, DOB is Social Security numbers. Uh, his home address is 6517 Rancho Santa Fe. Las Vegas, Nevada, 89130. His home phone number is... And his cell phone number is... Interviews being conducted at the ISD building on 4908 at 0029 hours. Present are myself, Detective Hardy, key number 3031, and Thomas Randolph. Thomas, do you understand the statement's being recorded? Yes. We want to, you understand that we're wanting to talk to you about the incidents leading up to what happened in your house this evening? Yes. Right. Um, you had told us that you had employed a person by the name of Mike, is that correct? Yes. Can you describe Mike for us and any names that you know him by? Just Mike. Michael. Uh, I think his last name's Miller or Milner or something like that. Um, how old is he? He said he was 38, but I don't know how old he is for sure. He's got a bunch of kids. And, um, according to their ages, that would be about right, probably 38. And um, do you know where he lives? Uh, sort of. He lives in the condos down by Ann Street. I don't know exactly. I know which one it is, I don't know the number. Okay. And um, do you know a phone number that you could reach him by? Uh, yeah, I don't know it by heart, but it's on the phone somewhere. <clears throat> I, we talk on the phone 10, 15 times a day. Or now, not that, maybe five times a day. Just, you know, the jazz boss, I'm a jazz fan, so I owe you a dollar, that type of thing. Does he uh, have a vehicle that he drives? No. How does he get around? Mostly the bicycle, but he borrows his, I think it's his uncle, he lives with his, uh, their car just once in a great while. I know there's a lot of, um, he says there's a lot of uh, rift at the house about, you know, getting a job and getting money and he was talking about moving out or getting kicked out and they don't let him borrow the cars to get to work, but they just got him not working. And, 
Do you know who he lives with? Uh, I think it's his aunt, his uncle. And when he did drive a car, what kind of car was he driving? Uh, a couple of times he's been in, um, I believe, his aunt's car, which was a, like maybe a RAV or something like that. Dark colored, dark blue, black, something like that. And what about his bicycle? Does he have one bike that he rides? No, it always seems like there's a different one. It seems like there's two or three of them. But... When he would come over to your house, where would he park his bike? Easily in the back, but off the, somebody would steal it off the... He used to chain it to the gas meter, but that was kind of tacky, so I just had him bring it in the fence. And set it inside the swimming pool gate on the, the one that we get open by hand. And uh, how long have you known Mike? Four or five months, maybe. And does Mike have any tattoos that you know of? Mm -hmm. um, what's his hairstyle like? It's a little short. Is it short or is it bald? I'd say it's just like nothing. It's just short. There's a name for it. The fade, like, pardon me? A fade. Yeah, I think that's what it's called. Uh, Sharon, no, she's an hairdresser. Um, so you've known him four or five months. How did you meet him? At a convenience store, I said they're getting my car. It was a terrible sense of getting my car washed and sweating. Right. Um, and and uh, over by Walmart, I don't know the, the cross street. Right. But, you know, where they wash it and they detail it for you. I was just in there just waiting, and he was in line before me getting a beer, and uh, it was like he had been doing you know, manual labor because he was all dirty and stuff, but uh, there were three people in line, and he just, he just kind of joked, and I was like, ah, this, is, this lady, she didn't ask me for ID, she does that every time, I come here every day and buy a beer, but she always asks me for ID. And, uh, so now today I don't have it or something. Anyway, so it's a little worry. I'll just get it for you. So I uh, just pay for the beer, and I just didn't get it for you. And he uh, said, "No, that was yours. I'm getting this one." I said, "Then I want or something." So I ended up getting both of them. I don't drink very much because they don't us and stuff. But um, just chit chatted there and. He took off and I got my car down and I was going toward the house and I see him along there and just pull over and say, hey, need a ride, you want my way? Sure. So I was at this pop in and sat over in front of his house the first day for probably an hour and just talked. I mean, I've been telling Sharon that you get out and find some man friend, you know, just sitting around the house, laying around the house all the time. It's just making me lazy. Mm -hmm. And I uh, had a couple, but they just didn't. One of the dope that I've met, and, you know, was always very easy bike, and I just can't do that or just come back too much. So I just didn't, I haven't had a lot of, Sharon Hughes on this to me, her old friends that don't interact with her much anymore, but I just haven't met any of them, and I haven't been over, so. And so you just meet Mike at this convenience store, and you start up a conversation, and how does it come that he comes over to your house and starts doing work? Uh, he says he does a lot of work. I was asking him what he does, and he says he's working to be a carpenter at the uh, a cement and uh, you know, like like concrete or whatever to be an apprentice. He was going to school or getting into school for that. He hadn't got in yet, but he just works part time. And um, so he just says, you know, what what do you do? And he's only just do whatever he can to get money because he works. He works with his uncle, as so he said, at night at the airport, cleaning up the airport or something like that. And uh, then he told me about Area 51. They really do fly people out there every day. He's seen it or something. And so do you engage him to come over to the house then and do some work for you? Yeah, uh, yeah well, we, I talked about doing something. Excuse me, and he says, I've got to help you if you need some help. I ain't got nothing else to do. And uh, um, I called him and, and asked him if he really wanted to work. And he said, yeah, you can.
him over. And I said he's not good at what he does, but he's, he's, he's a good worker. He works consistently. And it's not like going down and getting a couple of Hispanics on the corner. So how often does he come over to your house and does work? A lot, a lot. He's also come over a lot just to watch ball games. And he's, he's ate dinner with us two or three times. He's uh, went over to Collins and done work over there at her house. Um, I think just once over there. But he goes with us once in a while out like to the clubs or you know, to the Santa Fe. And, but we sort of was having a problem there. He was like calling every day and wanting to borrow just a couple of bucks. And, and it just, you know, I told him I just can't keep doing that. So, so how much money has he borrowed from you since you met him? How much does he owe you? I don't know, two, three hundred bucks probably down. But he paid, I mean, he, like I said, he paid a lot of it back at the beginning. They borrow 20 and pay back 20, what he said, and borrow 50 and pay back 40, and then a few things happened. And, what happened? Um, he got his check, and he actually showed the check, and they garnished his wages for child support. So he did have a bit of money, so I loaned him a couple hundred bucks that time. Sharon was, was getting on me about that bitch, and about him always wanting money, so she was... And then also just, you know, just pop in. And I like my privacy. I told you, you know, if you call and we don't answer, don't come over because I'm in bed a lot. I'm I'm, I'm sick. I mean, I got this thing, but I also got hepatitis. So then I went to the Channel Lane thing for the upper GI, and they gave me some more shit to make me sick. So I've been I've been pretty sick lately. I've been in bed a lot, like weeks at a time. But um, he's came over a few times, even when I was Sharon's called him to have him come over and do plans and stuff. And a couple times I wasn't there, uh, and maybe one time I wasn't there. It's been a couple times that um, you know told him, let's do this tomorrow, let's work on the shed or whatever. And, uh, just tell him, I, I can't do it today, I don't feel well or whatever. Or he'll show up and I don't feel well. And, Go ahead and you know, plant some plants, cover up some trenches, whatever. Has there ever been a problem with him, um, a falling out or anything, where he got upset or you got upset at him? No, no, not really. A couple of times, and it's, I think this, I, I said something to share about. I thought he was kind of pissy that he was leaving for a week, and my dad just had a stroke, and that he. Uh, was it, it was but also he said he had the key um, that he didn't say bye to me because he'd asked me to borrow some money and I told him I just couldn't do it. And we was at the casino eating and playing the slots. They were like to go to college or does. He said he had a key. Yeah, he, this is when he supposedly had the key to the house that he found the key. And when was this ago? Mm -hmm. Probably close to two weeks ago. But it turned out that I talked to him the next day because I asked him, I said, what the fuck, you know, there's something going on at home, you didn't even tell me why or anything, you know, I'll be gone for a week. He says, no, I gave you busy feeding your face, you had your face in the tacos. And he went over and said bye to Sharon, but I didn't hear it because I'm deaf. And that's what she says, well, I'm sure he said bye to you, he didn't even catch it. This so, key that he had, what was that to? Back door. Uh, We're talking about the double back door. I think it's the air. I think it's the everything except like maybe the lower lock on the front door. Seems like that jammed or something. We had to put a different lock on it. Okay. Um, anything else about Mike other than what you've already told us? No, I really like the guy. I very kind of has to be a pest about borrowing money and stuff. Did he ever tell you about anything that he had been arrested for? Mm, child support. I think he just got arrested for child support not too long ago because his broke Matter of fact, his uh, uh, uncle called me when I was in Utah. He didn't realize I was in Utah. And I wanted to know if I'd seen Mike. He hadn't seen him for a day or two. I told him I hadn't seen him, but when he went and did, I gave him a message. And Mike called uh, either the next day or the day after that. I told him that his uncle was looking for him. And he's probably in trouble. And he 
used to be in jail, something about something happened at that, um, what you said earlier, that motel, six budget motel or motel six. Is that what you said? Yeah, budget suites, so I'm going to say. He said something about he was at the <clears throat> fiesta and he got on a bus or something when they stopped the bus, the cops did, and pulled everybody off of it. And okay. Something about there had been a shooting and they ran warrants and he had a child support warrant or something. Have you ever seen Mike with a gun? No, just started up. So he was able to shoot a couple of times and actually went up to, got the car loaded up and went up to shoot. And there was where we was going to shoot. We're not sure where to shoot at around here, but we got a uh, map from BLM and the best we could figure we was at the right place. But there was. Did you uh, know where your guns were inside your house? Yeah, some of them. Okay, which guns did you know the location of inside your house? Um, well, I always like my gun, but it's a gun I'm going to carry because I carry mine, you know, a lot when I go out. But, um, did you know the location of any of the revolvers? Yeah. Which one? Um, the 38 for sure, because he actually. It, it, he, uh, it's a clock, it's a fake clock in the drum room, uh, and it's the paint on it. Sharon went to paint it, took some of the little holes out of the wall, and I guess she put it in to paint it, and she's, she's blind in one eye, so she gets her, I guess, both eyes. She gets a disability, I think, for something to do with her eyes. So you have the 38 was in the clock? Yeah, it's Sharon's. It's a gun, you know, it's like a gun safe clock. But he was talking about, well, I could paint this here and paint this here, and it looks bad, it really does. I don't know if the paint was old or not shaken up, or she sure. just, just didn't get the colors, but you can definitely see two colors of paint. Is that on the wall? It's on the wall. Okay. And that's where the 38 was at. So he knew where that one was? Yeah, he, well, he just he knew that one because he actually reached up to show me where he had painted and then I pulled off the wall and fell down. So, yeah. Did you know where any of your other guns were kept? Um, yeah, one's like mine is up in the attic, just sort of keep everything up in the attic just close, but those are my guns that I just bring back and forth. And Mike knew where that was? Uh, yeah. And when you say up in the attic, where at inside the house? It's not in the house, they're in the garage. There's a, when I put flooring in the garage and we store stuff in there. There's just between Cher and I, we got too much stuff in the, all of our houses to put in one, so. So these guns are up in the attic? Yeah. There's a couple of them. little access yeah. door up there? Yeah. Um, did you know where any other guns were inside your house? Uh, stereo, um, 
Is this um, just been random stuff, or has it seemed to increase since you do Mike? No, I think it, I think it was mostly before Mike. I don't. Okay. Well, it, some hand tools I miss, and I just can't find them. And I swear, I told Sharon. I know the Mexican stuff that well, was helping me unload stuff, but she said, "Don't worry, they put them yet." Yeah drive them there and pick them up, but it makes sense. And, but I look for them, and I, I put stuff places and then forget where to put them, you know. Just Today, um, did Mike come over today? Yes. About what time? 3.30ish. And the reason why he came over was what? Um, well, he was actually going to finish putting trim on the, on the, uh, on the back, we, it was leaked in, uh, tore it off and put some shingles on, I couldn't lift it or anything, I kind of supervised him while he did it. But. So what time did you come over? About 3.30 today, but I talked to him a couple times in the morning, and just told him I'm not getting up, I'm the first time I've slept in days. And so he gets over there about 3.30? Uh -huh. How did he get there? I don't know for sure. I assumed he rode his bike, but I didn't see his bike, uh, I didn't answer the door. Sure, yeah. So he came inside and did you guys go somewhere? Yeah. Where'd you go? Um, I was going to go to the bank and I missed the, we started bullshit and talking about the chick he was with last night, his girlfriend, and started talking about his girlfriend. I wasn't paying attention and I just plain missed the road that I should have went to. And, so where did you guys end up going? Um, I took the exit that goes by the hospital, and I should have took the one that goes, the one before, I think. So I just kind of drove around the circle there, and then Sharon already told us if we don't get going, you know, I'm not going to see that we're going to be late. So I'm going to go. He wanted to go somewhere. He wanted to go. You want me to take him to the text and stuff up by his girlfriend's? Did you go to a uh, jet ski dealer? Yes. I went to the jet skis, because that's what I told him I'm taking him some money out of the bank and was looking to buy jet skis. Where did you go? Went to the Kawasaki place uh, and he looked at a black motorcycle. And this was the one down on uh, Rancho? Yeah. And how long were you there? Probably 45 minutes. I got to go, we're going to be late. So. What time uh, do you think you left there? 15 to 6 maybe. And where did you go after you left the jet ski dealers? Well, the first thing is we walked across, just we parked over by the Honda place, and we kind of walked over there and just looked around. Just we stood on our side by the car there, we just looked through and pointed out different um, jet skis and stuff that was there. We talked about that I had shot there once before and looked, and he said, they'll give you a better price because they're next door. So we so you left there. Left there, and went to um that's when I wanted to take him up by the text and I uh, told him I could and we just went down that way. Because I was just taking him back to my house because I really thought he had his bike or something. So you went up Rancho? Went up Rancho and then I turned and said there's this um, a car wash back there by the bus stop and I can get a ride there or something. And I don't really know where I said I just flipped around and went back but it's not very far up the road from Rancho. You said that was up by the uh, Santa Fe in the uh, Texas, up by the casinos? Yeah, it's between those two, it's somewhere there. Or so. so you dropped him off there? Dropped him off, and I was there. he got out, and I actually went by and flipped around to come back, because I didn't see where he left. I think he went in the liquor store. Where'd you go then? I went home. And uh, you get home about what time? Uh -huh. 506, 506, 6, 605, I mean, just within minutes. Sharon was calling right as I was turning into the subdivision to let me know we're going to be late if we don't hurry. And so what happened next? Um, grab the stuff when we left. Just all I did was grab a brief piece of paper with my medicine in it. And uh, you told me that uh, you and Sharon had taken your grandson Nicholas, mm -hmm. back to her daughter. Right, I asked her if, she, if everything was ready because it was running late. And she says, we're going to be late if you don't hurry. I said, I'm ready. I'll be ready. It's just uh, lock 
down from the boat. So is everything ready? And she says, yes. So I assumed everything was locked up, but Nicholas was ready. When you leave the house, do you normally lock all the doors? Yeah. Um, the back door is normally locked? Yes. And so you load up Nicholas, you drop him off at Colleen's, and then you go to the Santa Fe to the charcoal room. Right. And how long were you there? Uh, from as long as it takes to get there until about when I called 911. And who knew you were going to the charcoal room this evening? Mm -hmm. Everybody Sharon talked to on the phone, which would be all of her friends. Uh, Colleen. Did Mike know? Yeah, Mike did know. Did he know what time you were supposed to be there for dinner? Yeah, actually, because like I said, she had called and we had reservations and she had already told us to hurry back and make sure I wasn't late and he was there in front of us. All right, and did you receive any calls from Mike while you were at the staff meeting there? No. <clears throat> did anybody else join you? No. And so you left the Santa Fe, did you go directly home? No, we went over to the Cobble Bar and played, had a couple of drinks and played uh, video poker. And then Sharon went over to uh, a different part of the place and played video poker until she lost all her money. Then we went home. And during the time you were there, did you talk to Mike on the phone at all? No. And leave the Cabo bar, you go directly home? You know, when we went to the other section she was playing at, I went to the bathroom and, and came back because she had, and actually I cashed out some money and she was still playing. And, uh, when you leave the casino, do you go directly home? No, we started to and then we went to um, Funny's, so it's called Funny's Gas Station on the corner there. There's, anyway, there's a gas station there, not just around the corner. And she said, we better get gas now because you'll, you'll, uh, it's going to go up tonight because of the weekend, over the weekend. So we stopped and filled up with gas, and I think that was it. And we went home. And what were you driving to see? Uh, the Honda. The Hyundai. The SUV? Yeah. So you go home, and when you arrive at the house, Tell me everything that happens. Um, I pull up in the driveway and we have to stop because we can't get, get too much shit in the garage, but can't get both cars in because there's racks on each side of the of the wall. So we always have to do this. One of us has to get out. The passenger has to get out and go in. And so she was the passenger? Yeah, she was the passenger tonight carrying the food. And what was she carrying? Um, I know my steak, I don't remember if there was something off her plate that was left or not, they boxed up, but... Was it in a bag? Yeah. Okay. Um, what else was she carrying? I think she had her purse, because I know she spilled some stuff. So you let her out, did she get out in the driveway or in front of the house? She got out in the driveway. Actually, she, she kind of... She got out really before I stopped. I was going to pull up a little bit further, but it's kind of a little home there. So she gets out of the car. Um, Did you notice any strange vehicles parked in front of the house? No, our next door neighbor just moved in. He's got 30 cars there, so he does. So there's always not his. I mean, he's got so many, and then the next door neighbors. Did you notice whether or not uh, Mike's bike was parked anywhere? Right? No, I didn't look for anything like that. When, um, Sharon got out of the car <clears throat> and went into the house. Which door did she go through? Uh, the big garage door and then, uh, you know, just the regular door. It's down the hallway to get into the house. The so she went through the door from the garage? Yes, through the, house. Through the garage door. Okay. And did you hear anything? Didn't I have the radio on or she had the radio on? Um, that's pretty loud because I don't hear. I'm deaf in the ear, and uh, as soon as she got in far enough that I could start pulling in, I started pulling in, and it's, um, it's really close. I'm going real slow and got up there and then pushed the garage door, and it came down, and it actually got too close to my car. 
and I was having a hell of a time to get a path on to push the mirror in a little bit to give me a little room to get out and get out. And, um, I started to go over to get my bag, but the seat was, I forgot, I folded the seat down to kind of hide it at the bar so you don't get into it. And, and this was your bag that was in the back seat of the SUV? Yeah. And uh, just went on the door and when I walked in, we just got the little teeny hall light on me. You could see pretty good. Which I see. You went from the garage to the house to the garage door? Yeah. Okay. Now it took a few minutes because I was at the garage door to make sure it comes down. And when you were out of the truck, did you hear anything inside the house? I didn't hear anything. And you enter the house and what do you see? Sure, I'm laying on the floor, just laying face down. Right in front of the, the in the bedroom and right in front of the bathroom and the, the you call it my the music room, my drum room. Okay. She's just laying face down, not moving. Was she laying on her stomach, or was she laying on her side? She was laying on her stomach, and, and I don't know again if this is just hype, if I'm if I'm hearing things, if I'm spooked, what? But I thought that I heard something just as I was just opening the door, like voices, you know, like somebody talking. Did it sound familiar? No, no, it just it was just you know, it may just be my imagination, something like someone at the door, something you know. And I don't even, I, I wouldn't swear that I actually heard that. Um, and I could see things out of the corner of your eye. It just said, I just looked up and I was looking like, what are you doing on the floor? And I thought she felt that she just struggled with her hip. And it was like, almost like somebody jumped across type thing, or maybe it was here and stuck their head up and went back like that type thing, but from where to where? Either from the bathroom, if they jumped over into across Sharon into the other room, the other but room. I didn't see that. The other room would be the music room. Yeah, it'd be the music room, or it was in the music room and just coming out and duck back in when they heard the door or whatever. But uh, I didn't actually see it. I didn't say a scene. It's just kind of like I mean, just the spots you see out of the corner of your eye. And I seen Sharon. I yelled Sharon. And she didn't say anything. And um, I actually I thought I seen blood, but it was the bag that I realized I see now. But Where it's was the bag. Right up close to me, right by her body, right up close to her. She might have been laying on the edge of it. But um, she wasn't moving. And I just stood there kind of for a second trying to see if she answered or whatever. And I started to go to order and then all of a sudden I just, I, I got spooked and uh, I was just right by the door anyway and I just had to step back in and grab the gun because I, I keep one in the shoe rack right there. Shoe rack where? In, in the closet. There's a... This is, uh, let me draw this here. This is the garage. This is the door leading into the hallway. And then the music room is over Wait here. Wait for The music room is there, the bathroom is over here, and the master bedroom is down here on the end. Yeah, but there's another, there's a washer dryer with two double slider door, not slider doors, but right bifolds. Right as you come in, so there's a washer dryer there. On this side. Right, and then there's another room in here. Okay. And then right in that closet, there's a shoe rack. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. There's so there's another bedroom right there. There's a bedroom back in here behind here. Okay. And that's okay. actually an office. Okay. And so this would be as you come in through the door from the garage into the house. This would be on your left hand side. Right. So you go into that room. And into that room, and just, we just grab the gun, had a gun and a clip, and I had a couple more clips up on the top, but, you know. And which gun was this that you grabbed? The, the macro, I think it's the one I had in there. The, the gun I had, the okay. gun that I shot my with. But, was it loaded? Yes, of course. Okay. Yeah. So you go into that room, you grab 
grab the gun and then what happened? Clip, just a clip by it, and uh, as I come out, uh, he was running, not running really per se, but right down the hall. I mean, just, I was actually in the room, and he came in and kind of, we bumped into each other, and he had his, had the mask down, but it, like, it wasn't on, you could tell he was black, um, because it wasn't on the way down. It was like maybe you could hear or something, like maybe you pushed it up. But I mean, we ran right into each other, and I realize now that I, I don't know if I hit the door jam or hit his head. This mask that you're describing, what was that? It, just a dark, a black, or a dark blue, maybe a, um, I'll call it a ski mask. And did you have that pulled all the way down over his head? No, it was about, it looked like it had rolled up once. Okay. Like just once. Maybe. So above his nose, below his nose? Probably right below his nose, yeah. Okay. But, and, and I know that when we hit, um, that well, we kind of scuffled really because he actually had the gun in his had a, uh, I don't know if he had it inside, like, this, uh, like a sweatshirt thing. I don't know if he had it in, in the pocket of there or down in his pants or he had it there or what, but we kind of was scuffling a little bit and he said something, I don't know what he said for sure. Um, did, what, did you recognize the voice? No, no, I was, I was, uh, it, it surprised me he was there and uh, just, you know, went into the fight or flight mode, it just, it, it, uh, uh, Where did the scuffle take place? In the hallway or in the bedroom? Both. Both, because I was in the bedroom and had grabbed the gun and stuck the clip in the pocket and was coming out and we just kind of hit right at the door where he was coming in. Okay. And um, um, we just kind of got up there together and he was doing something down here. Okay, and when you say he was doing something down here, you're indicating that he's reaching into the front of his pants or the front of his shirt? Something, something down there. Or he may have already had his hand down there and that's just when I noticed it. But did you see the gun? Uh, later I did. I didn't see it right at that particular time. Okay. So you guys bump into each other in the doorway, you're scuffling, and what happens? Uh, I we just kind of bumped, and he was kind of... I don't know if he was fighting, really, but I was just kind of trying to get some space, because he kind of surprised me, but I was just kind of trying to push back. And, uh, pulling the gun down because I had it beside me because I was going to look around the corner and see what was going on. Which hand did you have your gun? Right hand. So I grabbed the gun at the same time, put the clip, just like a motion stuff, the clip in my back pocket that it, so it's clear. And, uh, so you was clearing space from him? Clearing space from him and uh, just a few inches of our shot. I mean, I just I started shooting him just as soon as as soon as I got a little bit of room, and uh, one of those, he, he went back, he turned around, and that's when I did see that he has a gun in his hand. It turned out to be the revolver, but I didn't, didn't know for sure what it was. But Which gun did he have? I don't know. He said it was a revolver. Yes, a revolver. Which hand did he have it in? I think it was his right one. Okay. I think it was his right one. And so how many times did you fire in that? I don't know, as many as I could. Just as many as I could. And, and he turns around, and what happens? Uh, the goes to the door. I know shot. I, I know I shot toward as he was going out, too. And I went right with him to see where he was going. And went out there, and he... Okay. When you say the door, are you talking about the door leading into the right. garage? He was, he was going for that, for the going out the garage. Did you fire again in this hallway? Yeah, I believe so. I believe so. I, like I said, I fired a lot, and then he came out and turned around again. Okay, now, and is he in the garage now? He's right at the doorway right there. I think he was trying to open the garage door. Okay. Over, I mean, the big garage door over. Just the garage door open. Right as you come in the door. You come in the door and just reach around and turn on the light. And, um, and when he turned around and faced you again, did you still have the gun? Don't notice. I, I, I just kept shooting. I just kept shooting. That, that's just all there was to it. I shot and shot and shot. And um, then he fell down and it was all 
Hopkins is shirt there. There was a couple of bags. Um, but I'm thinking he had those in the car, like a change of clothes because he was going to his girlfriend's house or something. He had said, and I think he had, um, uh, they were Walmart bags. And earlier he had had them, and I think that he had them. I think those was, I mean, I know those was there too, but I don't know if it's the same bags he had earlier. And uh, there was a, cloth bag that is my stuff, is this the bag's mine, or Sharon's, I don't know, and it had just thought and then shit in it, um, because the dispatcher told me to look at the gun and make sure it was away from me, and while he was in here, I was sitting there, I was standing over him. You're talking about in the garage. Yeah, in the garage, and um, um, heard a, heard a noise. I'd already turned around and go back to the chair and I started to, and I heard a noise and I just assumed it was him and it was loud. And I turned around and shot it again once or twice. And he was laying there, he wasn't even pulled anywhere and I shot it again. But it was the fire extinguisher had fallen off the refrigerator. And I just remember hearing the noise. And when I went out to look for the gun, when the dispatcher said, we, you got to, you know, I, told him what was wrong with my wife and that there was a lot of blood and stuff and she's hurt bad and the guy in the garage and they asked about that and I told him what's that, you know, just with my wife and, and uh, Let me just back you up just a little bit, okay? You hear the noise in the garage which ultimately you realize is a fire extinguisher. I'm assuming that's what it was, yeah, because it was laying on the ground. And you fired how many more times? I think just once more, because once or twice maybe. Okay. That was just more of it, because I you know, just heard that noise. And yeah. I'm imagining the TV thing, you know, where the last time they get that last breath out, shoot you. Did you take anything off of this guy while he's laying on the ground in the garage? Did you take the mask off? No, the mask was laying by him. Um, I went through the bag. Uh, looking for the gun, because I didn't see the gun, as it turned out. He was, you know, I guess it was up in his pants or underneath him anyway, he'd fallen on it. And this, whoever was on the phone told me to get the gun and make sure it was away from him. And uh, I didn't know As I said, let me just back you up here a little bit, okay? You hear the noise in the garage, which eventually you think is a fire extinguisher. Yes. You fired a couple more times. At I think I just fired once more. When did you, what did you do after you fired a couple more times at him? Uh, went in and checked on Sharon. Okay. You know, I kind of, actually I put the, slid the rug up under the door so the door would be open so I could see him because I still was, you know, I don't know what's going on, I wasn't going to check on him, I wanted to check on Sharon. So you go up and you check on Sharon? I tried to roll her over, I tried to talk to her. Um, I bent down and that's when there was a, the gun was there because I bent down on it. It was laying somewhere in that vicinity. And near Sharon. Near Sharon, yeah. It was actually pretty close to her because my knee was on it. Or that's what my knee or my ankle or something touched on it. It was uncomfortable when I bent down. And when I looked over and I seen the gun, I thought, okay, I don't want to get shot by this either. And I don't remember. Was the gun in the hallway, or was it in the bathroom, or the music room? It was in, it was on this side. I don't think it was, I don't think it was in the music room, but I think it was, like, just almost in the music room. In the hallway? Yeah, in the hallway. Okay. But I did see it. It was, it was, I mean, I've just been there, just not looked good, because I was looking first at the, the red stuff, because I thought that was blood from the distance, and when I got out and could really see the blood, it was bad and tried to talk to her to see if she would respond. And um, I went to call when found the phone. What did you do with the gun? I first, when I first picked it up, I was checking to see if it was cocked again. And I don't know why, but I seen a little thing on the side. I was thinking, that will make the clip fly. I said, I know guns, I know guns. But I pushed that and thinking that was like a safety thing. and. The cylinder started to roll, so I was supposed to back up and toss it over there. Over and I, there. Just over 
and the room away from me, further down, so that... Into the music room? Yeah. Okay. I don't know, not very far, but, you know, just out of the way. Okay. And, um, called and I went, went and found the phone, and again, it's a little, little, kind of spooky, you know, kind of... Where was the phone? Uh, the phone I got out of the living room, out of the, with the big screen TV. I think that's the phone I got. Were there any other lights on in the house? Yeah, we got lights that come on with timers and stuff, and I, I didn't notice. I was just hurrying. I didn't notice if there was any other lights that shouldn't have been on that was on. Or did you notice whether the back door was open or closed? I didn't even look. I didn't even look. I grabbed the phone and called 911, and it didn't work. And I thought, oh, fuck, what a great time for Vonage to go out. Because we had a lot of trouble with the phone. And called them again. Called two or three times, and the first time it didn't work. Second time, I think it was busy. And then I found out I told somebody. They told me to settle down, settle down, and asked me what happened. And then they got confused. And then somebody else came on, and I think it was a paramedic or something medical, and uh, said we need to uh, to start rescue the. CPR on your wife, and I told him that I, that I didn't think she was alive, I think. I told him I didn't think she was alive, and she was uh, shot bad. And just coming from the blood, you could tell. And um, he says to start the, not the CPR, but just the chest thrust, and asked him what position she was in. I told him, I, I think I told him face down, but I didn't have to roll her over. And told me to roll her over, and I started to do this, and then I got nervous again about the rest of the house might be down there. And I didn't know it might get them necessarily just nervous that he was down there still. And um, I said, what a, well, I'm kind of scared if the other guy gets up or something. And the guy says, go, go check him, go get the gun, go something. And told me to find the other gun and get away from him. Is that what you did? Yeah, I, I, the bags was kind of in the way there. And I, Where were the bags? Right here and over on this side, maybe a little. And the mask was right here, close to it, too. Okay, so we're talking about in the garage now. Yeah. Okay, so you go into the garage, and where's this guy laying again? Right about there. Okay, and where you came, okay, just outside the door that led into the house. Yeah. Okay, and where were the bags? Uh, right as you come in. There was one, I think both the plastic ones is here, and I threw one of them over here after I looked through it, or just, you know, in the garage. garage. Yeah. Okay, so and you're indicating to the left and right of the door. Right. right. And then the mask was over here somewhere, and it was just laying right by him like it fell off when he, you know, when he, lay, when he fell down or whatever. And did you see uh, his face then? No, but I know it's not I could see his face, but I can tell from his, his, because his face is down. Right. But, uh, and where was the gun? There was none. Okay. Uh, I looked in this bag, and I think it might have had jewelry in it or something, I don't know. Uh, so you're indicating the one to the... No, there was a black one now, a black, uh, black bag. Smith's or Walmart, where you buy them, they're disposable, or you keep them, I'm into bags. And uh, there was a bag there, and I just looked through it real quick, and I didn't see anything. And that's when I noticed the fire extinguisher, and it was under the edge of my car. And I stepped over because I thought maybe the gun is, is what I heard. And I don't know what I thought, I just thought maybe the gun was over there. And I stepped over, and again, they were painting my pants because the fucking light in the garage went off at that time, the timer light. And it was just dark in there, the door. And, um... Are you still on the phone with the 911 operator? Uh, I laid it down, laid the phone down, so uh, over my shirt. Okay. And I stepped back over, and actually I kind of stepped hard back over because I didn't want to step on him or the bag, kind of what a stretch for me to hurt my bag, back. Reached around, turned the light, but no, I think I flipped the light on the inside, there's a light. Anyway, I flipped one of the two lights back on the garage and uh, kind of pushed him over. And I, I think I pushed him a little with my foot and 
kind of lifted me with my arm and kind of just, I just went like that. And I could feel around there. And I felt the gun down there and I picked it up. Where was it? Underneath. Under, I don't know if it was in this pant place. I mean, in this pant place. And this, I, there was, I think he has a pocket there. Because it seems like when I reach in there, my hand it went in a pocket. Maybe when you came hot, like in the front of the shirt? Or maybe, you know, you got the ones that go all the way through, like football players use. Like a sweatshirt? Yeah, the sweatshirt. You always wear the sweatshirt. Okay. But I don't know if it went all the way through or it was just a pocket. But I remember I kind of got my hand caught in there and didn't like the idea of my hand being held. And, um, so you pulled the gun out? Well, I didn't have the gun. It wasn't the pocket. When I pulled it back over, then I could see the edge of the gun. And I just pulled it up. I don't know if it was in his pants or what. I just grabbed the handle and pulled it up. And which gun was that? Uh, it's just a revolver again. Did it have um, like a, a grip uh, extension or something on it? A silver piece that attaches to the grip? I didn't notice that. I just threw it in there. Now we have a 22 that you're sort of describing like that. When you uh, took the gun away from him in the garage, where did you put the gun? I threw it in the uh, office. The drunk to the first bedroom there. Okay. So the first bedroom when you come through the gap. Just throw it in there or where do you think you placed it somewhere in there? No, I just kind of just chucked it kind of easy. I actually was aiming for the garbage can. So I don't know if I hit it or not. And then I locked the garage door. Okay. And went back and got on the phone and the guy says, we've got to get to your wife now. And I says, I don't know if there's anybody else in the house. I haven't been through the rest of the house. He says, I just want to get you lose your wife. You need to get on this right now. I says, okay, you know. And she was big. And I tried to roll her over. I tried to roll over. I couldn't do it. It was just out of breath. And I kept getting her so far up. And then I just couldn't hold her. And so I told him, I tried this four or five times. And I told him, I just can't do it. He says, you've got to do it or she's going to die. So I said, okay, I'm going to try this again. It's killing my back. And I laid the phone down and um, pushed her arm, kind of like they teach in CPR class. I pushed her arm kind of back underneath her. And it seems like I pulled one of her legs up a little bit toward me that was toward me. And then lifted and pushed her over. And she was... Did you do the chest compressions? And what was the next thing that happened? I asked him if we, uh, I told him I didn't think I could do the CPR because she's really hurt bad, bleeding bad, and stuff's hanging out and stuff. And he says, what do you mean? And I, I don't know if I told him. chest compressions for now and he told me between her breasts but I'd already pulled up her shirt and found the thyroid and started doing them. I said just keep doing them and I did a few and then I remember they're supposed to count so I started counting. Um, I did 10, 15 or so and then checked for a pulse and there wasn't anything and he says keep doing them. Where did you check for a pulse at? On this, across her body on this side of her neck. So you check her neck for a pulse. Yeah. Here, it was on this side. So you're facing on the left side. Yeah. She was laying face up the left side. So and what's the next thing that happened? Um, I started doing more. I said, I can't get a pulse. And he says, keep doing it, it doesn't matter, keep doing the compressions. And I started doing them again. And then he said, uh, the police or the paramedics or help us here, go open the front door. Okay. And it took a long time to open the front door. And that, I am thinking that when I opened it, you know, unlocked it, it did not lock. And I know that I flipped the emergency, the, the thing to make sure the kids aren't running out the little alarm and it always is on and I swear that I undid it and I undid the locks 
And then once I opened the door and they wouldn't open, it was like I locked them and turned on the alarm instead of unlocking them, like they might have already been unlocked. And uh, what did you do with your gun? Stuck it in my back pocket. Or else in the back of my belt, I can't remember, it was somewhere back here. And um, when I opened the door, there was just cops everywhere telling me to put my hands up, lay down, come out, whatever. And they reached back in and flipped on the light so they could see better. And came out and they took me away. And I tried to tell them what was going on, but they just kept on going. And they couldn't get in the house. They couldn't get in the house. And, and I told them how to open the garage. They told them I'd go in and open the garage, whatever they wanted to do. But they took me way down. It took them forever, forever to go in there. I bet you it was 30 minutes before you got in the house. And backing up just a little bit, when you were in the uh, first bedroom there and you were struggling with um, the person that you say is Mike, what, what is the reason that you fired? Um, what did you feel? Well, I was scared to death. Obviously, my wife was down in this fool's in my house, and he ain't supposed to be. And wearing something on his head, that looked kind of funky. And, and uh, At that point, did you think he had a weapon? Yeah. Okay. All right. And then the reason why you continued to fire was? I was making sure he was not shooting. Okay. And at some point, did you ever get a look at his face? Uh, when I rolled him over, I could see it was his, his face, but... And is that the person you knew was Mike? Yes. Now, I seen the gun when we, when he... After we got a little bit of space... Matter of fact, he was, he was going to shoot me. There was just no doubt in my mind he was going to shoot me. I could see the gun then, but uh, when he was actually up, it was just too close. He came in and I was coming out. And he's kind of trying to look around to see what I got in my hand. Because he's... And down, I think maybe it's when I bumped his head or bumped the wall or something because I got a little, little, in case blood when you spit it, little thing. Okay. Um, did you know that he was going to be coming over to your house tonight? At 3 30? No. The yeah, same thing when you left the house. Oh, no, 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 no. He did no. not have permission to be in your house. No, no. He was put, I thought he said he was going to his girlfriend's. Matter of fact, I know he said he was going to the store for us because he said he was catching hell at home. And as far as you knew, um, he had had a key at one point, but gave that back to you. Yes, he did. And I actually thought he didn't give it back to me, but um, when I, I was kind of checking, when I started when I called him because I was getting ready to leave, I said, hey, earlier you gave me that key that you said you had found outside. And it's, it's all laid it down. I'll lay it down to get the garage. Uh, sometimes it will just fall out of the pocket. Sometimes Sharon leaves it in the door. So, I mean, the keys, there's keys everywhere there. Was there a reason why you were concerned about him having that key? Yeah, well, he was going to be gone for a week. I didn't want him, to, didn't want him in my house. Like, you know, he didn't have Colleen comes over. She's pregnant. She checks the mail and stuff. And I have both neighbors watch the house. Does your house have an alarm? No. It has those door. Excuse me, it has those door things. I have a, an expensive alarm in my in Clearfield that I've been meaning to bring out here in my home in Utah that I'm releasing that it's all digital and plug it into the computer and it'll you know, do the video streams and you got five thousand pictures of the guy before he ever gets up your driveway. And then it emails you pages you and calls the cops for you. But between the time that yeah, again, you first encountered him in the house and the time that um, you started performing CPR on Sharon and the police arrived, did you touch anything else or move anything else inside the house other than the phone? Touched the guns. Okay. Touched. Did you open any drawers, close any drawers, move anything around in any of the bedrooms other than the guns? And the phone. I would have went in the 
caused it to get the, to get the pistol. But that's in the bedroom. And it's just in a, it's in a, there's a bunch of shoes there. And there's one that there's a little bit of space and I keep that and clip right there together. Um, I think I might have got, went to the truck to see if the phone was in there, if Sharon's cell phone was in there, because I had, she had had it out just before that, because she spilled stuff out of her purse or something, or I don't know if it rained, what was going on, but okay. I started to go out there and I just ran back in and went to the, got the other cell phone. I may have had the cell phone, and was good, no, not because I hadn't got it yet. No, I don't, I don't think I touched anything else. And when you shot the suspect in the garage, where were you standing? Were you in the garage? Um, no, I think that's right where the light switch was. Well, yeah, I guess that happened in the garage because the light, the garage light went out. No, I'm sorry. I, I was either just in the garage or just outside or just in the doorway still. Okay. But I did go out in the garage because I went over here or went over here looking for the gun. Okay, so you moved around inside the garage. Yeah, and that's what I said. And then the lights went off and that just scared the shit out of me because I thought there was somebody else that had, there at the house and I turned the lights off so I couldn't see them and then I really started to get freaked. Okay, the party. What was the lighting conditions inside the house when you first came in after your wife had already gone inside? It's pretty clear. I mean, it's, it's dark, but you can see, okay, there's one, I think it might be orange or reddish, you know, like a colored ball, maybe 25 water that we leave on the nights. So I can't sleep at night, just like okay. that kills me, so I wander around the house. But from the garage door inside the house, you could tell that that was your wife that was down in the hallway? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. And at the point you saw her down on the ground, um, you hadn't seen anybody else at that point? No, other than this is kind of like that. I just, I get those all the time anyway, because my doctor calls them uh, floaties. When, how long after that was the first time you saw Mike? Just within 30 seconds. I said, Sharon. So, fuck it. Just immediately went into the, I stepped up, maybe went two steps and just came back. And right there was that doorway. It was open and just reached in and grabbed my gun. It was just right, right there inside the hallway. How many guns do you have? I, I had quite a few, but not that are accessible there. And put it away so don't get stolen. I change them around as we need them. The gun that you used, do you recall what caliber or what it's which a, gun that was? It's a Makarov 9mm. It's not the standard 9, it's the, name, the uh, Russian 9. Okay. And in that first room, as you come from the garage into the house, the first room on the left, I'll call it your office, not your music room. There's a larger revolver there. Do you recall that gun? Is that your gun? There's a there's a what? I'm sorry. There's I'm a revolver. revolver. I'm sorry. There's a revolver inside that first room. There is. There are you asking? Your I'm question? asking. Well, I'll, I'll tell you that as you uh, this is the hallway. This is the first room on the left, and this is the garage up here. As you come in from the garage. When you come into here, there's a desk here, uh -huh. and your computer's right there. Uh -huh. Sitting on some clothes or something is a revolver right here. Do you know anything about Was that? Was it on the desk? Is it the, is, I threw it over there. I threw that over there. That's the gun I took off him. But I was aiming for the garbage can, which sits right. Okay. So I don't know if I missed it hit the clothes or missed it hit the desk or what. Okay. And then in the music room, there's another revolver. 
that's the one that was right by Sharon. And when I went down on my knees, I could feel it. And that's the one I picked up. And I got a little uh, 22 mag, and when you put it on safety, you turn the cylinder just a touch, and there's a little groove. Not There's a groove that cocks it when you turn it, but there's a little groove that if you turn it, that put it on safety. And I, I, when I got the gun, I just, I started, I pushed a little thingy on the side, and I swear when I did, I was expecting the clip to fall out, because I don't do revolvers. Mm -hmm. And instead, the cylinders, what they call them, the cylinder, I could tell it was starting to come out, so I just pushed it back up. But I originally was going to just put it on safety and move it over there. But I just threw it over there. I mean, I didn't throw it, it couldn't be more than a couple of feet from the door, but I just kind of turned around and laid it there. Okay. Did you, do you, the one that you took off the hem, do you recognize that as one of your guns? I didn't. No, but if you're saying there's a trigger, you said a... If you look at the grip, the grip on the gun looks like this, right? On the guns right here, there's a, uh, I think they call them grip extensions, and it looks something like that. And it's silver. And Is it silver? Yes. Okay, that's probably our 22. Probably sure it's 22. I didn't notice that, but no. I mean, that there's a gun like it's really heavy. I mean, heavy. Yeah, it's as heavy as a 38 if it's the one that, that we're talking about. But it's not rubber or anything. It's not like one of those uh, pack fire grips. Right. It's just a metal insert that goes. Yes, yeah, she said her uncle had funny hands or something. And he, had that put on there because he couldn't hold it or something. It's, I guess that's where she got it, was her uncle. Okay, and then the, the gun that's in the music room, that, do you recognize that to be one of your guns? I didn't, didn't look at the it. One that, and that's the one that was near Sharon? Yeah. Okay. Um, all the guns that you have, any of them registered? Uh, I don't know if hers are or not. I assume, well, she had a little blue card I found once. That was there. What about your marker of? Is that registered? No, just put it back from Utah. Just put it back from Utah. Okay. Um, what do you mean registered? I got concealed buttons from it. Locally, you do? No, I got it from Utah. Okay. And in November, they said they were reciprocal, so you didn't have to go through the gun permit thing no more. Okay, but with, uh, with, with Metro, did you have any of these guns registered where you would have had to take them down to a substation? They would have given that given you a blue card. Uh, no, that's what I thought the gun permit thing was. Okay. I have the forms. I paid the money, got it filled out, got all the guns listed on the form, and even called and they told me to come early in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then the lady said something that she didn't need to do that, that they had changed the law or was going to change the law. So I looked it up on the internet and it said in October and November the legislature had changed the law that it was reciprocal with Utah. Okay. So I have a Utah gun permit, so I didn't need to anymore. Okay. How close were you to Mike when he fired? I don't know that he fired. Uh, Not when you fired. Me, you, me, me, you, probably either one of you. And just as soon as I could get enough distance to the, to the, I mean, he was right up in my face, like he was reaching, trying to, I thought he was trying to get my gun, but it was... So you're in a cave about three feet? Yeah, a feet and a half, a feet and a half. But we was close. I could hit him just as easy, but that's... I don't fight. I've got this bad back neck thing, and I swing at you, and I might just be standing there still swinging at you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. so. And this this was in the house still? Yeah, in right, the hall, right around that bedroom door. Did you fire any shots in the garage? Yeah, no. And has Mike ever been to your house by himself? I think once. You mean where we knew he was there and left him alone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I left him alone, like to run down to the store or something. He's yeah. working in the yard or something. Has there ever been a time that you told Mike, uh, go to my house, I'll meet you there, or... Has there ever been a time that you've shown up at home and Mike's been there and you weren't aware of it? That he was there? Uh, yeah. On both, both 
those situations. But once we was going to uh, do some plant or something, and I called and uh, he said he was on his way. He was there closer than I was, so I told him to just go around and sit on. He parked his bike in the, in the back by the, the side gate. We don't have a lock on it. Most of the kids are there. And he puts his bike there off the street so nobody will steal it and or trip over and sue us. And uh, another time, and, and I told him then just to go ahead and sit in the back and I'd be there in a minute. It was just, just I mean, a matter of minutes. And then another time, uh, I can't remember if he was on the front porch or the back porch. And me and Sharon, me and Sharon was both there. And when we pulled up, he was there. And didn't think much of it. He just said he was coming over. But he wasn't inside your house? He was outside. He wasn't in the house. No. He was outside both times. And what, we got a, a swing outside. I don't think it's under the deck, under the porch now. I think it's moved. But it used to be under the porch, and I've been working on that. So but that's where I told him just go sit on the turn okay. be there in a minute and do what we got to do. Did you ever hear the shots before you went inside the house? Did you ever hear any shots? I didn't hear anything, but that's, I'm, I'm really deaf. Okay. What was the first thing you thought when you saw Sharon laying down? I thought she'd fallen. Okay. When, when did you realize that there might be somebody in the house? Well, I'm the paranoid sort, and when that little flowy or whatever, that just kind of, you know, it's like, did I see something, or is it one of these Stephen King things you dreamed about last night? But I started to go up really quick, and I said, Sharon. And then she didn't, didn't move or anything, so I thought, okay, something ain't right here. And um, that's why I went in the room and just got the gun, because I just, I've been paranoid about these Mexicans, and Mike is really fed off that paranoia with them. Like, if I go down and get some to move things around, I'll have him help too. But Sharon used to go get them, and we get two or three out there working and couldn't understand them, so our new role was to get at least one that speaks English, so we kind of can communicate. Also, it's like sometimes we have a waste of time, we tell them to move everything, and then move just the opposite. And I know you're up there, you know, doing it yourself with them, you don't know. But they're at the last, I have mine, and then I just had one Mexican or two instead of hiring two or three, and he kind of kept them going. But he told, and there's been one Mexican that told me about another one, says, hey, watch your guy. I said that he's going to steal from me, or he's going to steal. But he said it in broken English. Not to, not about Mike, but about another Mexican. Right. And then Mike had told me that he had came out and seen some of the Mexicans looking through the boxes rather than putting them up in the attic and said something to him. When you called 911, you mentioned that this guy Mike has been ripping you off. What do you mean, what do you mean by that? He's been stealing from you, or ripping you off, I think, were the words you used. I don't remember that. Okay. Don't remember. So Do you suspect Mike of ever taken anything from you that you just could never prove? Uh, money, uh, just little bits of money. But I just gave it to him, so I didn't think much about it. Um, the key, that's about it, the key. Okay. If I said, then ripped me off, probably what I said was, he's ripped me off, or he's ripped me off. Like, the act right then. Okay. Um, in your kitchen, there's a uh, freestanding, like a butcher block type cart. I believe. Okay. And I think it might have even had like a red cell phone sitting on top of it. Um, but there was a there's a steak knife sitting on top of this butcher block cart. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Uh, it's freestanding. We don't have a red cell phone. Okay. And, and I don't know if that's uh, was sitting on that cart. But on this cart is a steak knife sitting out. 
should have been. We, we were careful about the knives because Tom is such a year old. Is, that's why the guns that went up higher. He crawls and climbs and he lets. Matter of fact, he can open almost all the doors. Like my drum room, I keep them locked because I made the mistake of letting him play the drums. So it's play drums, play drums, and he screams and yells. He's pretty good. Actually, he can beat for two. But uh, I lock it when he's there just to make sure. Because also my medicine, my, my, my uh, when I take, come home, I take off my gun and just lay it there. Whatever gun I'm wearing that day. Did you have any phone conversation with Mike today? Oh, I talked to him two or three times today. Uh, from your cell phone to his cell phone? From his home, I don't think he has a cell phone. I mean, his home number? Yeah, I've called his house several times today, or he's called me. And would that have been from your home phone number or from his so, home number? Both cell phone or probably the house phone, either one. Um, he was going to help me finish put up the trim. We're going to go get my I said, my dad had a stroke, and my mom had this uh, gallbladder that ruptured, whatever, and their children, and he had to do an emergency real quick. Well, my dad was, it was really weird. She got his room as they was moving him to the nursing home, because he didn't, couldn't do their rehab program was strong enough yet. But, uh, told him we had to get that done today. It was the last day that was going to have a chance to finish up on it. The uh, trim around the, the uh, deck, not the deck, the awning, so that the water and stuff couldn't get to it. It looked a little bit better for the kids, but we went and bought some trim. That was today? No, the last time I was with him, we went and bought some trim. I think he was with me, but he was by myself, I don't know. That, that's what we do, is just kind of ride around and talk. You know. When he calls your, your number, is there a name that pops up on the caller ID? I don't think so. It's just his number. But I mean, I know his number because I got it on my phones. But I don't. I don't think it says a number of a name or anything. Okay. And uh, did Mike know you guys were going to dinner tonight? Yeah. Yeah. He, he knew what your plans were. Well, yeah. He came over and Sharon was, you know, told us we need to hurry and don't be fucking around too long and just you know go look at him, come home and do what you gotta do. But it was just bloody, kind of. But we was going to do the earlier in the day, we was going to do the uh, trim and uh, finish plant the plant. I think Sherry wanted something else moved. And I slept last night. I fell asleep during the ball game with the kids there and everything. And my sleep was precious to me because sometimes I don't sleep for days. Mm -hmm. And I fell asleep. And well, coming home from Utah, I couldn't drive. I started driving just nodding off. And Sharon drove, was just bad because she's got bad eyes, but she drove other than twice for maybe 20-30 minutes. She drove the whole way, but I just kept nodding off. I couldn't stay awake for whatever reason. And I think it's probably all the stress, you know, then from my dad and my mom and stuff, but um, got home and, and didn't sleep that night, but then the next, or I don't know, maybe slept the night, next night, but then last night, like I said, just, and today I was so tired and I slept so good. And he called him, said, you're going to start work. I think I called him first and said, don't bother coming at such and such time because she's going to cut this lady's hair she forgot about. So she cut the hair and then, uh, I don't know if he called me back or whatever. I said, I'll just make it later because I'm going to sleep for a while. So, Is there anything else um, that we haven't talked about that you think is important to what happened at your place today? I mean, it sure took a long time for them to get in the house. I don't understand that. But I guess that's how the police do it. I just... some like hours where they was ever in there to do first aid or anything. I don't think it matters. I think she was probably dead then. But... Is there anything else with Mike? Is there anything else to go that clicks in your head and says, yeah, you know what, this makes sense because of this. Sharon's been saying he's been giving her really weird vibes and a couple of times she said, don't invite him over in case he goes to dinner or something. And one last week, we were, a couple of weeks ago before we left with my parents, we said he was going out like on a date to the Cabo and uh, he wanted to borrow some money and I think I maybe gave him 20 bucks or something. 
And that's pretty clear. It's a date. We're leaving now. And he left a few minutes before we did. And it hadn't been 15, 20 minutes. And he showed up at the Cabo right next to him, sat down, and Sharon was real glad to see him, I guess. And, um, you know, I told him I couldn't loan me no more money and told him to, um, he needed to leave, you know, quietly. Because last night I told you he kind of did say bye to me. He's pissed off at him, so I called him later and asked him why he acted like that. And he said, no, I said bye. He had your face buried in that taco or whatever he was eating. And he probably was the right idea, plus I didn't hear him. But Sharon said he said bye to me and came over and told her bye. So, but she just said she, and I think it's just because he's been coming over so much and we don't like the popping in. And usually when he comes in, he wants to either borrow a few bucks or work and get paid off because you know, I'm getting the same thing I did the Mexicans when they work. So maybe a little more. But he's drove me to the doctor uh, once when I had the